The Know Your Gear podcast is not responsible for any spontaneous guitar purchases you make during or after the show. The Know Your Gear podcast. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode 350. 350 Know Your Gear podcast episodes. Uh, and I just want to say thank you. So today we're going to have some fun. I know we always have some fun. At least I think we always have some fun. But today, probably a little extra fun. And I hope you guys uh, are in, in the mood for that. Um, so uh, a couple things to get into first. Thank you guys so so much for supporting this uh, podcast for 350 episodes. I know it's kind of funny because, like, you know, we're used to, like, the old days when TV shows and, and uh, radio shows, when they, when they were excited about having so many episodes, it was because they didn't get canceled. And uh, YouTube, you don't really, you know, it's like the ratings don't fall, and, you know, and then you stop making the show. Um, but it's not... In, Maybe it's not impressive to have 350 episodes, but it's impressive to have 350 episodes with continual growth and uh, the fact that we could even talk <laughs> for 350 episodes about the thing we love, which is guitars, is uh, is impressive. Um, so a couple things to celebrate 350 episodes. Today we'll be doing some quick giveaways for the people live, but more importantly, since the majority of you consume the show either through audio or video, we're going to be giving away some cool stuff. So uh, there'll be a link down below. Let me show you what you can win. And it ties into a great question. Uh, somebody emailed me and says, Phil, 350 episodes is your room real question <laughs> mark or a screen and uh this comes up although i think if you watched every episode you know that this is just my office and it is real so i thought we could kill two birds with one stone as uh so to speak so let me talk about the giveaway that you can win because i think it's gonna be cool so we're giving away an orange wood dolores acoustic let me grab it and then and then my mic's up here. This is why I usually don't go behind back to the room. So first, there's just to show you guys, I'll yell, look, it's a real room. <laughs> so let's talk about this guitar for a second. So what are we giving away? We're giving away an Orangewood Dolores. That is an all solid guitar. So it's a solid uh, torified spruce top. So that means roasted with solid mahogany back and sides. It is a beautiful guitar. It's worth about $800. Sounds really nice and I'm gonna say breathy. But that would be a cool guitar, right? 800 bucks, you win a cool orange with a guitar, guitar, but there's more and but wait, we're also giving away this amazing, okay, it's not amazing, it's just really good, really good hard shell orange wood case. It is beautiful inside and out. Look at that, a little red velvet for you guys. But I was thinking about this going, it's only acoustic, not electric. So we're giving away a $320 Fishman Rare Earth pickup system. And if you haven't seen this, it is really amazing. What it is, is it pops in the sound hole right here, okay? But it also has a adjustable microphone. So it has a microphone that you can hear the acoustic in, and then of course the magnetic pickup to pick up the strings. This is $320. You can pop it in this guitar, or you could pop it in another acoustic that you love that you already have. Either way, you'll get that. And then, because you need to be in tune, you'll receive a $30 rechargeable snark tuner so that's like eleven, twelve hundred dollars worth of stuff. Plus, we'll give you some stickers and picks, know your gear swag. So, uh, enter to win that. We'll give it away next Friday. Gives everybody who's watching the rebroadcast a time to win the guitar. And um, and I wanted to do that because I thought, you know, so many of us have electric guitars. A lot of you guys don't have acoustic guitars, or you. A lot of guitar players, <laughs> especially electric guitar players, they have like a dozen or half a dozen decently or nice electrics and then they always have this like $200 acoustic so this is basically a thousand dollar acoustic and uh so um I mean it's $795 but you get the idea 100% solid wood you'll notice it's gonna it's gonna breathe really well sound really good and uh so the guitar the case the pickup system 
some stickers uh, entered to win that. And then let's get into the fun of the live show and talk about not yet the giveaway, but we're going to give away some swag packs, some stuff, um, some cool, the cool people at Strandberg Guitars. They reached out to us. They sent me an email saying, hey, Phil, I thought I heard your 350th episode and you do some giveaways. Can we send you some stuff? And they sent me some cool swag overnighted. And I'm probably a little overexcited about one of the things, but I will definitely share it with you and give some away. All right. That's all the the stuff, right? That's pretty much all the the uh, the giveaway stuff. So let's get into some questions, subjects, things like that. Let's make sure. Uh, first, of course, we also should take a second to thank the moderators. They have the blue names and blue wrenches uh, for sending me questions. They send me additional questions and, of course, moderate the, the audience and stuff and make sure you guys are all being behave because you need to behave. Remember, everybody... ELE, everybody love everybody, and uh, or at least try to. And then also thank all the patrons and members for supporting the, the podcast. Okay, so uh, this first one came from Andy Brown. Hi, I'm from Australia. Phil, with the availability of high gain amps, is there still any need for a high output Strat pickup? Uh, what are the pros and cons of a higher uh, V lower output pickups? I think... I, maybe I don't. Know. Anyways, uh, what, do you? You know, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna expand this question a little bit. The question really should be, and I'll, I'll deal with this, the single coils for sure. But the question is, you know, with high gain amps, you know, you, when you think about the super distortion, you think about the first pickups that were pushing more, uh, in, pushing the amps harder, especially with boost pedals and tube screamers. You know, trying to get those amps to get every little dripping piece of distortion out of them. Um, you know, do you need that with these higher gain amps? Uh, the, the truth is, you really don't. But the reality is not everybody's playing those kind of amps. I mean, for every person who's playing a, a Mesa Boogie or a Saldana or something that has all the gain on tap you would need, there's somebody still playing the old school Fenders, Voxes, Marshalls, and still running the old. So that's where the need of the pickups is. So to answer your question, no, you don't need higher output pickups uh, to push uh, amps into higher gain settings, just like you probably don't need tube screamers and uh, boost pedals as much with the high gain amps, although there are reasons why you would still use those. For the most part, you don't need to push those amps into higher distortion levels because they can generate that on their own. But the irony of this is that music is never ending, you know, the amount of sounds you want to create. So there's still uh, never ending ways to create those sounds, whether you go back to the old ways of doing it or the new ways. And and uh, me personally, um, I I like high gain amps when I, I want to practice. It's just easy to play. But man, when I play either in front of people or I'm recording, I'd still like those mid or lower game amps and then trying to push them into overdrive, you know, even more distortion. So I still like the, to push the amp a little bit the old school way. They're just something, you know, I don't know. It's, it's an emotional thing. I can't tell you that it's better. I'm not going to argue, oh man, it's just the old way. It's just they can't get the sound. It's not about that. It's just a feel thing. There's just something about the feel. So there you go. Um, so there you go. Um, let's see. Um, uh, let's, where else is it? Okay, let's do another one. Okay, so. Okay, another question we have is DP says, I'm noticing new gear being sold as used on Reverb. It seems like companies are using this in order to not harm new prices. Have you heard about this in the past? And we've talked about this in the past. Uh, this is from Chris. Um, yes. So the answer is absolutely yes. And there are culprits that do it. In fact, um, you know, last week, I'll, I'll tie into this because a lot of you guys are asking me about the update on my my little puppy, my dog. I mean, he's six years old, so I don't know if he's a puppy. But, um, and he was having seizures. He's still having seizures. When I say still, he hasn't had one since, obviously, uh, last Friday. So I want to say that. That's the good news. But, I mean, he's going to have them for the rest of his life. The new medications are working. A lot of you guys reached out, uh, especially a lot of you who had experiences with your dogs and even medical training and gave us some great suggestions. And we probably imp implemented some of them as well, so, you know, um, but the new medications ha are working and, uh, he, he seemed a little different for a few days cause they were so bad, but he's really come back around and he's, uh, back to him old self, his old self. And that's great. So why that ties in, uh, to the reverb pricing thing was, you know, I liquidated a bunch of gear cause I was, you know, the, these, the, uh, <laughs> 
the the expense the expenses you know he's on basically human drugs and there and uh there's no insurance well there is insurance for dogs but we don't have it and so and then he went to an emergency room so i liquidated some stuff and um I was put up a few things uh, that I wanted to sell, but everybody on my patron page, they pretty much bought everything up. And so I sold way more than I thought I was going to sell. So I, I indulged. I indulged. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you what I, I did. I bought a guitar this week. I shouldn't have, but I did get rid of six, <laughs> basically seven guitars. So, um, and it ties into your statement. Um, that's exactly what I do. So let me show you what I bought. It's something I've been thinking about for a while. And um, the price was just, you know, it's just, not there for me. So let me show you the guitar and then I'll explain how, what, why it ties into your question. So I've been wanting a uh, Godin uh, S.A. Slim. This is a nylon string. Do not confuse it with the other models they have. This uh, is the nylon classical style uh, thin body guitar that Godin makes, uh, Godin, but it has the uh, you can see here the smaller nut, the narrow, more narrow nut. So uh, same radius fretboard, same scale length, but a more narrow nut that's going to feel more familiar to an electric guitar player. And this is something I've been really wanting to get. However, $1,800. I just couldn't justify it. I'm sorry, guys. So what happened was exactly what you were talking about. Um, I did what I tell you guys I do quite often. I went on Reverb and I uh, looked at, let me go back to my main screen. I looked at a bunch of guitars, these guitars. I basically, you can follow it or put it in your favorites. So I put a bunch of them, about half a dozen or dozen of these in my favorites. And of course, one popped up that was interesting from Pro Audio Star in New York, which is a company that's notorious for blowing out stuff and saying it's used or mint condition. But of course they have like 10 of them and they're in box and ready to go. And I found one for $1,259. Uh, so you can imagine pretty significant savings from the $1,800. I mean, that's, you know, $500 off. $500 is a lot of money to save. However, I didn't buy it. I just watched it. They sent me an offer that took it down a to an, an additional, I think $150 more off or something like that. So I put it at like $1,100. And so I went ahead and, and did it. So I'll do a review of it because I, I want to do a review of this guitar because like I said, it's got the slimmer neck. So um, they are out there exactly what you're saying. There's a ton of ton of retailers out there and they don't, they don't want to violate the map, uh, which is the minimum advertised pricing policy with the uh, companies. Uh, two, two, fifty, two, five, one says Pitbull Audio, question mark. Yeah, Pitbull Audio also does it. I mean, there's tons of them. We already know there are tons of online retailers that are notorious for doing it. But then, like I said, there's just tons of ones that are just doing it now because, like I said, they're overstocked on inventory and they have deals to go. In fact, it's it's good if you want to buy gear. It's not so fun. Like a lot of times I just like to follow things, like hit a favorite on a, on a thing on Reverb just to watch it. You know, like I'm thinking about it. Maybe, maybe one day I might get it. And not only do you get offers almost everything I follow, but almost everything I watch now on Reverb, even if I don't follow it, if I just looked at it, I'm getting an offer emailed to me saying this company offered you an email. And I go, I, don't, I only looked at that for like one second. Why am I getting an offer? Um, definitely, um, definitely, a uh it, it's it's a time you know it means that it's a sign of the times right now so yes tons of companies are listing gear that is absolutely new as used okay um you have to kind of decipher when it's being done and how it's being done sometimes it's re now sometimes they refer to things as demo and demo could be legitly something hanging in a store and it will be new with a warranty but it will show show signs of use because it was in the hanging in the store but there are lots of retailers right now i mean lots and lots of gear being sold as basically either open box as a demo as uh, used as, you know, all kinds of things. And th there's a couple ways to, to tell, and you definitely don't want to just assume because a retailer is putting something as used and, you know, it's, and that it's brand new. Um, there are some signs. One of the signs in this particular case was in the description itself. Um, even though the guitar was listed as used, the description basically said that it it's it's in box. <laughs> Ready to go. <laughs> There, that's usually one of the biggest tells is that, you know, it's like, hey, this, yeah, this is a used item, uh, 
new in box. Now, if you want to make sure that you are protected, that's something that you want to make sure that you are not buying something. You know, if you think you're getting a, a deal and you're a little concerned that maybe you're not getting a deal because it says, you know, used, but you think it's new, you can verify that with a nice uh, message to them or email. I will, I usually do that. I'll send them the retailer an email saying, hey, could you elaborate on the condition of this uh, amp or guitar or pedal? And uh, just give me, you know, if you have detailed pictures, anything to help me make the purchase, you just say something very kind like that. Nine out of 10 times in my experience, you'll get an email back saying, this is new in box. They'll just say it. They don't even care. They don't have time to do all that. They'll go, the, um, I told you guys I bought an amp uh, a few months ago and it was listed as used and uh, I got the feeling that it was new in box. So I emailed them and said, hey, could you give me some details on if it has any you know, blims or damage or anything like that. And the response was, it's new in box. We have 10. I think they said 10. They might have said more. And I was like, all right. So I bought it and I got it for about 35, 40% off new. So, um, and think about this go down. I mean, that was a huge amount of savings, you know, 700 bucks off the price of the guitar uh, made it worthwhile. In fact, so you know, there is uh, about a half a dozen legitimate used versions of that guitar being sold by, uh, you know, resellers, you know, people like us, normal people selling their, their used guitar and used prices are fluctuating between nine and $1,200. So, I mean, I just paid, you know, the, the used price legitimately for a new guitar. So to answer Chris's question, yes, it is common. It's out there. It's always been out there, but in markets like this, where it's really soft, you're going to see a lot of retailers, uh, taking advantage of any way to discount inventory, um, until that inventory thins out, which it's going to take a while, you know, um, as we all know, it takes a while. Um, let's see. <laughs> okay. I'm just looking if anyone has any follow-ups or any questions on that stuff. Uh, Brian says, I got one of those new used guitars. The price was great, but but of course, there was a reason it was great. Okay. <laughs> the price was great and there was a reason. Okay, good. I think I'm reading that right. Uh, let's see. If it is new but sold used, do you still get a warranty? You will as long as they're a legitimate um, dealer for that company. So this is not to be confused with another scenario that can happen. It's not as common in our industry, really common in other industries. Um, so... We all know about like Ross, you know, stores. I mean, maybe you don't know. There's stores like Ross. There's stores that basically buy up inventory from other retailers uh, on pennies on the dollar and then they sell it like as a blowout. So I'm not talking about um, outlet stores. I'm talking about like literally the stores that are known for. I think Big Lots does it. You know, there's a lot of stores that they buy inventory from other retailers, not the actual manufacturers but sometimes manufacturers, but mostly other retailers. They buy the the, the, the product that can't be sold very, and they uh, buy it at a deal and then they pass the savings on to you. That is not super common in our industry, but it can happen. In other words, retailers can buy inventory from either retailers or in very rare cases, the manufacturers that they're not even a dealer for because everybody's trying to liquidate a lot of stuff and they could buy, you know, tons of this stuff and then blow it out on, you know, on reverb or their websites. And that is where you want to be, pay attention because there should, there could be a situation where there's no warranty on the product. Now, so for instance, if, uh, if in the scenario I gave you, um, the retailer I purchased from is a dealer for that brand and they are selling this product, even though they're selling it used, I've told you guys this before, that technically if you would have a problem, the manufacturer won't know uh, how to address this as anything other than it was sold to you new. Okay, does that make sense? Uh, and I'm not just guessing on this. I told you guys I've had experience as a dealer with this with companies from Fender and Ibanez. Ibanez is a little tricky, but most, uh, most manufacturers well, if they sold me the product as a dealer new and I sold the customer, whatever shenanigans I played in this, like I discounted or I listed as used or whatever I did, um, they're not only going to not know about it, but it really doesn't factor in. What factors in is you bought the product from a, a, a legitimate dealer and that dealer did buy it new. Now, uh, so that's that's important to, to understand those things. The other thing that's important to understand is that one of the things that's nice about the purchase I made is that the product was not listed as sold as is. It was still given the 35-day return policy from the retail seller. So 
it's just like buying from any legitimate business like Amazon or, you know, Sweetwater, or you name it, where they're giving you a return policy, um, a guitar center, you name it. So I didn't have, I don't have a whole lot of risk involved. Let's say I get the guitar and it's not in what I anticipated. I can still return it. So in some cases there'll be a restocking fee or maybe we have to pay to return shipping if it is as they described it. But again, you know, my experience is very few rare times is that ever happen any of those problems so so there you go um so uh so that is the i think that's why we flushed it out right um <laughs> i think we flushed out um yeah we did okay let's uh let's keep going uh let's see the next one um Okay, so this is from Adrian. It says, hey, Phil, do you think manufacturers will ever make quality acoustics for cheap like they do electrics? I'm amazed at PRSSE quality, but I can't get the same kind of value in an acoustic. Uh, you know, you can. There are tons of acoustic companies that I think give you tons of value for, for the money. Uh, I always say Yamaha is definitely a paramount brand for when it comes to that. Um, I think you can get a lot of guitar for the money. I really like Orangewood, although Orangewood is a definitely a direct to consumer marketed thing, and its its value is in the the like whoever wins this guitar, they're going to find out because it plays amazing. That uh, Orangewood is really following the business model of we'll sell it direct to the customer, and make sure it's set up and plays great and feels great. But you know, companies like Yamaha always comes to mind as really giving you a really high-end guitar for the price. Another company known for that would be Godin, but it would be under the brand Siegel, Norman, uh, and uh, and uh, Arts and Luthery are all acoustic guitars, acoustic guitars that I think you're getting a lot of value uh, for the product you're getting for the, and, and there's tons of others. And in fact, some of you guys are going to go, what about breed love? What about, you know, Washburn, Ibanez, all those. I mean, there's tons of great stuff out there for sure. Um, you know, Maddie says Eastman acoustic is great. There's tons and tons of great examples out there. Um, but I'm going to just tell you the ones that I've had a lot of experience with and I feel safe with. Uh, although I agree with probably most of the brands people say, cause they're probably coming out of the same factories, um, except for brands like Siegel, Norman and Arts and Luthery are coming out of the Godin factory in Canada, and that's a different uh, you know thing than what Yamaha and other companies are doing when they're having the source to either China or Indonesia. Um, so, yeah, I think um, there is a lot of amazing acoustics out there, and I mean. I don't know. I can't say they're as good as the high-end guitars. Like, you know, some of the inexpensive electric guitars are really good, but that's also because of the the time it takes to make them, the technology, and the volume for at which they can hit. Um, so I don't really think, if you're looking for an inexpensive acoustic that has high standards, I think you can find them. There are a lot of, in my experience, there's a lot of examples out there of guitars that I would say, if you want to use the Paul Reisman, the SE is like the, the baseline, the line to hit. Um, all those brands I just told you, I think comparatively for price to what you get are in the league of a PRS SE. No questions asked, in my opinion. So there you go. Uh, yeah, Gas Addict said lags. Acoustics are, are awesome. Fantastic. I, again, I, you know, like I said, I, I very rarely, is there anybody going to say a brand that I'm going to be like, no way. Because like I said, some of these companies will make inexpensive acoustics that are made for student level, but a lot of them make high quality guitars. Acoustic guitars, if this helps, Adrian, um, acoustic guitars, one thing that makes an acoustic guitar different than an electric guitar um, is that acoustic guitar is actually more like a recipe. Uh, if you follow the recipe, the guitar will be pretty good. I mean, don't get me wrong. There are some designs in the bracing have a huge effect in the sound. And, you know, the execution of the recipe is important as well. But a solid top acoustic with a very thin finish uh, is, uh, is going to be better than a solid top acoustic, or uh, sorry, a laminate top acoustic. A solid uh, back and, uh, you know, back and sides with the solid top. And again, a thin finish. You know, um, the type of woods, you know, using a spruce or a cedar top, you know, those are, are important. Um, whether they use rosewood or mahogany for the back and sides. There are a lot of things you can find in acoustic, and it's not that hard. You just go by this, the, the, the recipe and then try it yourself. So 
The only thing that's hard about that, if you notice, I always tell you I sound apprehensive, is because acoustics, people have strong opinions. Guitar players have strong opinions on how acoustics sound. Where an electric guitar, I can generally get most electric guitars to get in the realm of what I need them to do if I had to. It's really hard to get some acoustics to sound the way I want them, no matter what they're made of, it's how they're made too. So, But for the most part, what you're saying, I think you can find a lot of great guitars out there. Uh, that are priced affordably like the electric SE series is. Um, okay, so we have, um, I pinned it. Do I have it here? What did I do with it? Maybe I did, maybe I didn't. I have it right here. Okay, so I got a message this week from Fred Flintstone. Uh, if you recall, he had a message, I think it was last week. And uh, last week he said he had a little fret sprout on his guitar and he asked for a quick solution. And I said to put a sponge in a bag, cut some slits in it, uh, put some distilled or purified water in the sponge uh, and put it in a case with the guitar and see what happens. And he gave me uh, some, some feedback on that uh, suggestion. He says, Phil, I did the sponge in a bag trick and it worked. My strat is back to normal. I learned my lesson though during the winter, my baby and every other one else uh, is staying in their cases. It is 20% humidity in my house during the winter. So this is uh, one of those things, and I, I talk about this again. So thank you, first of all, Fred, uh, for the the feedback. It, uh, that's something I'm trying to do more and more on the channel since I get these ask these questions and no one knows, did that answer work? Did it not work? Um, so uh, knowing it worked is good feedback for everybody. Um, However, uh, what I want to make sure everybody understands is that yes, you can add humid. Like that suggestion I gave him works. Put some, put a uh, you know humidifier in a case and give the guitar some more humidity. However, I want to remind everybody that I told him that when I gave him that advice, I think last week, that there are some cases where it still won't work. So don't don't and don't be upset if it doesn't work either. Like I said, it's sometimes you get lucky and the guitar just dried out a little bit and a little bit of humidity puts it right back where it was and it's good and sometimes you just can't put the humidity you can't get the guitar back to where it was and that's when you do a little fret sprout correction with the frets and uh, and either way is effective and it's good but in his case it was obviously that's a nice hack to just do very quickly so there you go um i have some uh tim sent me a message. He says from Steve, this is one of the moderators, uh, Tim says, Steve, Phil McKnight, what glue <laughs> to me, Phil, what glue would you recommend for gluing Tolex to wood? I have no idea. <laughs> I'm refinishing a 212 cabinet. I have no idea. <laughs> uh, uh, I have probably re the a cabinet 30 years ago. I don't know what I may, I might sound, sounds like something I might've tried. Um, I don't even know. Uh, don't know. So sadly enough, but if anyone's tried and done it, but here's what's great. What's great about that question. And thank you for sending it to me is, um, we're doing some, some podcasts this year and, uh, they're going to have guests. These will be bonus podcasts. They're not going to be interrupting the Friday show. This will still be our time, but we'll be doing some bonus ones like this with questions. And we're going to save questions like that for the guests that makes sense to have them. And I have a guest who is absolutely not only going to know the answer, they're going to know the best way to do it in the world. And I'll make sure that they give you the answer. Uh, another question sent to me was from Joe, who says, Hey, Phil, I have a Fender made in Mexico PJ bass. When I picked it up yesterday, the P pickups played normal, but the jazz pickups faded in and out. Have you seen this before? And what could be causing this? Well, uh, my guess is uh, your the vibrations. Remember, you know, you hit the you hit the bass string, the, the instrument's vibrating. And if there's any loose wires or anything touching, um, whatever the touch, not everything just shorts out totally and sound off, sound on, sound off. Sometimes it can do exactly that. The volume drops, right? Because the whatever's grounding hasn't fully deadened out whatever's happening. So my guess is you need to go and tighten up all your electronics. I would make sure first both both in the bass, the uh, two volumes and the tone control are tightened. The nut on top of the potentiometers are, are tightened and they're not moving. And then I would go through and make sure, you can also make sure that it's clean, but it's not gonna be dirt dirt that causes that problem, but it's definitely some kind of short or something moving and uh, just tighten everything up and make sure the solder uh, co uh, connections are clean and good. It's, you know, like I said, but what's great is if when in doubt, wait, like I said, I always say diagnostics are most important. Um, just uh, take the take the, the two screws out or three screws out of the plate on the, the uh, 
base. We say it's a PJ, so I'm assuming it could be either a P base with a J pickup or it could be a, <laughs> a J base. Um, but either way, if it's a P base and you have that one long pick guard, just go ahead and remove all the screws and lift it up. And then when you hit a string, you know, going through your amp, go ahead and just shake everything, wiggle things. Try to see if you can recreate the problem by touching things and moving things around. And like I said, tighten everything up, clean everything up. That should solve the problem uh, pretty fast, I would imagine. I would imagine. So uh let's see uh okay let's do another one all right we have scott who says hey phil could you give us a quick lesson explaining neck radius and the advantages on different sizes i've been shopping for a new shredder electric so a very quick explanation would be obviously um the main neck radiuses radiuses are only on the fretboard so again it's one of those terminologies that we use and sometimes it can confuse new players all the time you know uh neck radius technically isn't something we we say it but it's fretboard radius is the correct term so it's only the fretboard that we're talking about the radius and it starts at seven and a, a quarter and it goes all the way to I mean, 20 is pretty common. So, and then it stops a lot of the ways. The most common ones you're going to see is seven and a quarter, uh, nine and a half, 10, 12, 14, 16, and 20 are really common ones. Each one, all you have to know is the bigger the number, the flatter the fretboard. Um, in my experience, once you get to 20, it actually doesn't, even though it's flat, it feels concaved. It feels like my when you go to bar a chord, almost like I have to push the center of my finger down more than the rest of my finger to get it to work. It could be perceptionally because I'm so used to playing on 10 and 12 inch radius fretboards and nine and a half. Um, the argument is that when you play a chord, especially a bar chord, your first finger isn't really flat. It never really goes flat. Okay. It's always kind of angled a little bit. See how like that is. And so uh, people like Fender decided, well, if we make it more round, Okay, the fretboard a little bit rounder, it will kind of fit with the finger better. And uh, of course, the problem with that is it makes it more difficult when setting up the guitar uh, to, uh, it makes it more difficult for uh, the guitar to get uh, the action low. Okay, that's, that's, that's one of the biggest issues that people have. So um, there is, there is a reason why a lot of shred guitar players want the fretboard to be really, really flat because they can get that action silly, silly low, which is good. So um, that's the main reason. What are the advantages on the different radius sizes? You know, part of the problem is, is that there's this old world and new world. And here's the issue. I, I really believe that a lot of the technology to build guitars now, they can build a guitar. Like I have a Kiesel 10 inch radius and I have a Kiesel 14 inch radius, a 12 inch radius. And, um, and, uh, out of the three, they don't feel or play any different to me in the w action. Right. And I would say that's really common. Now you can get a lot of guitars to play great. Some of you guys know that the John Mayer guitar, um, you know, has a rounder radius and you can get the action pretty low on that guitar. And, um, so it's it's not as important today. I really kind of always, I've learned that I used to think what radius I wanted and what I like. And over time I found that I just kept going to 12 inch radius. That's the one I like. And I just kind of go back to it every time. And I just, I'm happy there and it feels good to me. But uh, that doesn't mean it's the best. So I think um, you just kind of learn to play different ones and see which ones appeal to you. Um, it's kind of like neck profiles. In other words, how round it is, if it's a V, how thick it is. And you're going to change over time too. That's the other thing too that's tough. You know, they don't talk about this. Guitar players, <laughs> musicians, as the famous guitar players became older, one of the things uh, I think we learned the hard way is, like an athlete, it's hard to tell people that you're older. It's hard to tell people that you can't run as fast, that you can't jump as high. It's hard to, as a guitar player, tell people you can't play what you used to play the way you used to do it without help. You know, um, you know, sometimes you need, a, you know, longer times, older guitar players need, professionals, we're talking professionals, need more time to warm up. They need more time 
to get, you know, to get where they were when they were in their 20s. It's just how it is, man. There's not, no shame in that. But there used to be a, sh a shame connected to that. The reason I tell you that is because a lot of guitar players over time, they change. And the reason they change is for that same reason. You know, you you learn, <laughs> you learn that... You know, maybe a thinner neck was great when you're younger, but now you're a little older and a thicker neck is a little better. And maybe bigger strings were better and now thinner strings are better. Maybe thinner strings were better before and now bigger strings. So there's tons of reasons. But that that's the best way to explain the neck radiuses is that I will tell you, though, that if you like to do a lot of bar chords, it will be a little bit more difficult to flatter the fretboard gets. And if you shred a lot, it's a little easier. Some people will kind of mention uh, compound radius fretboards. And they are pretty cool as well. However, you know, they, they're they good, but I don't think they 100% solve all things, you know, so. Martin says, Phil, what is the clock showing? <laughs> it's showing you that it's 6, 7.30, 6.42. It's, it's 6.87 o'clock. Uh, what it is, is um, I have a decibel meter um, and I, I left it there. <laughs> So, um, uh, I have a decibel meter. Look, I'll show you. It's on a stand. Look at that. I made this, um, and, um, I have it. I can set it anywhere in the room. So, um, a lot of YouTube channels put decibel meters like on the wall or in the background. And, um, I don't, uh, sometimes that's to show you guys. I'm actually a lot of times want to see the decibel meter me more than I want you to see it. Um, although it's it's illustrative and I might use it in a video for illustrating to you guys, but a lot of times I'm trying to set the amp correctly or or do things that I you know want to do for me. And so I have it on a stand. I can take it in my other studio. I can take it here. It's just portable. It's easy. So today I left it there and it just happens to be over my shoulder. Um, so if, it, yeah, if the clock looks weird, yeah, it's not uh, 791 o'clock. <laughs> so there, there you go. Um, and uh, if, um, is that a thing? Do you guys, would anyone know, want to know how to how I assembled this uh, unit? I'll do a quick uh, short video of it and show you. It's three components. It's the unit itself, a stand, and a clamping uh, a thing. Uh, and, I, and all of it I bought on the Amazon uh, from the I got it from the Amazon in the forest. And uh, so anyways, uh, yes. So there you go. So that's what it is. And I can adjust the height, too. So there you go. Um, OK, uh, okay. Um, we got sidetracked. Let's get back. Let's get back. OK, so what I want to do. What time is it? Okay, we're, we're 30 minutes in. Okay, it's a metric clock. What I want to do is, uh, uh, I don't know what I want to do. I don't know if I'm, uh, let me let me do another question. We'll keep the subjects and questions going. Uh, Captain Grumpus, <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> great name. Okay, any fix for a sitar-like sound coming from a Floyd Rose nut? Uh, it's on an in four. Sure. Of course. Um, so again, diagnostics are your, uh, your friend. A couple things I would do is unlock the nut and see if the problem goes away. If the problem goes away, then you know, it's how it's clamped and that sometimes you might need to get a new, uh, uh, the new, uh, clamp piece. I don't know what they call that. The block. Um, uh, sometimes though, what's great about Floyd Rose guitars is they have a problem. And if you restring them, then the problem goes away. It's almost like resetting your computer. Um, it, but however, if you unlock the nut and it's still doing it, then you may have an issue where you need to raise the nut. And that's a really easy thing to do on, on a Floyd Rose nut as well. Um, especially on that guitar, you can raise it, you can put a shim underneath it, or you can, if it has screws in the back, you can undo the screws in the back and then same thing, put a shim there. You can use a business card. Um, you, if you don't want to go through all that trouble, you can do it by just putting, shoving a piece of paper underneath the string on the nut. Again, just try to raise the string a little bit and see if that fixes the problem. Um, that's a huge part of it. And if that helps, uh, you know, that should help. So there you go. Um, I always tell you guys, whenever you have buzzes or weird things going on in guitar, don't be afraid to just try to, you, I use paper. I mean, a piece of paper and a business card. I can use a business card. I have like cardstock all the time, always with me, like all the time. Constantly, I can fix stuff. Shoving this, I'll, I'll tear off a piece 
And like if I have a, a sitar effect in a nut, I'll take a piece of this paper and I'll literally bend it like this. I'm gonna show you guys like this. I'm showing everybody that it's like a little V now. And I'll I'll just tear a piece like this in a V and shove it right into the slot on the nut and put the string on top of that and uh, see what happens. Like I said, a lot of times you're just trying to, again, try to figure out where it's coming from first because if it's rattling from the bridge and you're spending all the time on the headstock, you're, you know, you're not getting anywhere in the same thing. So you, you just want to use anything you can to see if you can adjust height or, or make stuff tighter so that you can see if that fixes the issue and then move from there. Okay. Um, let's see, let's do this. Let's do something fun. Um, I will, Okay, let's, um, I'm looking for the next, a uh, next question with a question mark in front of it. So if you're gonna ask me a question, uh, Brian just said, put a question mark in the front. Go ahead and put a question mark in the front of the question. So if anyone has a question, tone paper, thank you, Sunbase. That's exactly what it's called. This is tone paper. I don't know if you guys know, you can buy this from Gibson. Um, it's authentic and it's tone paper. So. <laughs> Uh, all right, no questions. I know I have super chats, but I'm looking for a question. Somebody asked me a question, something they're curious about with a, with a question mark first. That's all. I'm looking for the first one. You guys got to be typing. Like I said, don't make it a super chat though, because I'm not going to count the super chat. I'll explain why. Maybe I'll explain why. All right, we got it from Miss Anthrope PDX. Says Phil, thoughts on the key intonation tool? I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's a great question. Let's see what it is the key intonation tool i am going to google this unless i'm missing something and it, i'm going to push it and if you're talking about the floyd rose you are okay cool let's uh i'm assuming this is what it is again guys you know sometimes uh all right this is the uh the this is the key it this is the intonation tool i have this tool um i didn't ever knew what it would call i was just called the floyd rose intonation tool um it's uh great and it will keep you sane if you have a floyd rose style instrument and you don't have one of these uh well then it's just gonna it's just longer and crappier it just makes this faster better and more finite so do i uh, like it i am i am um i'm not a gadget person don't get me wrong i don't want to like oversell it um but i am uh you know, I had this, uh, uh, I hung out with John, one of the patrons and his lovely wife with, and my wife, we all hung out at this uh, restaurant. I told you guys the story after the Kiesel event and we were talking about the old store and the old shop. And one of those things that came up and it almost like, it was like reminding me of the old times. My wife, I was talking about how many repairs I was doing a month and it was hundreds. And he, we were talking about how we would have so many repairs uh, that people would come in and we would ha fill out your paperwork and you would take your guitar with you. You would not leave it because we had hundreds of guitars for me to work on. I just, you know, and you would get a date uh, and I'm, I'm sure somebody's going to hate this, but it's just, it was how we were solving the problem. So what would happen is you would come to the shop. Some of the people watching this are from the store. So they're, you know, customer store. So they'll tell you this is how it worked. You would come in, we would look at your guitar. We would work up a workup sheet with a price and everything. And then we would give you a date. And that date was the day you came back with the guitar. And then we put you on the list to do the repair. Now, granted, if you didn't want me to do the work, we, we would could do the work much faster, but a lot of people requested me to do the work. Um, and it was just how I did it because I was working six, you know, six, six and a half days a week. And, and it was just doing as many repairs as I can. So, um, sometimes the reason I bring this up was one, it was an interesting thing to remember. And me and my wife, of course, on the long drive back, we were talking about those old days, but that also, I go, sometimes I go, maybe I never really connected that and told the audience. That's a reason why I do love things that make things faster and easier because I was trying to stay as efficient as possible with the work I was doing. So a lot of times when I show you guys a tool and I go, man, this is saves five minutes, saves 10 minutes. Some of you guys are like, who cares? But to me, it was everything. And maybe that is uh, not a big deal for you guys because, uh, you know, maybe time issues aren't your restraint, but mine were time issues. I, I would do so many repairs. It was just, it was crazy. And now I, I don't even think I could physically do the amount of repairs I used to do. And I did those for, like I said, over a decade. Um, it was just so much work. I was so used to it. I was just so used to working that hard and that much. Um, 
And uh, it's just because, you know, like a lot of people, I hate to say no to people. So it's like, you know, I don't want to say no. I've told you guys before. I hate the, I hate no. Uh, so, um, but yeah, so to answer your question, I, uh, I had that tool and uh, I love it. I have it. I have, uh, I probably have one or two of them. And um, so, yes, if you guys have a Floyd Rose, it'll make life easier and faster. And with that answer, I have something to give you. So the beautiful, amazing people at Strandberg Guitars, like I said, they wanted to be part of the 350 episode. They gave us some stuff to give away. So you are winning a swag pack. So what comes in the swag pack? First, you get a cool Strandberg hat with a sticker on it. Um, it's a truck style hat. There you go. That's cool, right? One size fits most. So you get that. You also get a Strandberg water bottle. It's actually a really good like aluminum water bottle. It's no Stanley cup, but it doesn't have lead in it. At least I don't think it has lead. By the way, I can't uh, disclose if it has or doesn't, but I'm assuming it doesn't. Uh, so you're going to get a cool Strandberg water bottle right there. Aluminum, aluminum. You're going to get some Know Your Gear stickers. You're going to get some Know Your Gear picks. You're going to get a $30 Snark clip-on tuner, but I saved the best for last, and it's my favorite. Strandberg sent this, and uh, this... Look, it's weed. No, um, Strandberg sent this, and this is amazing. i never seen this before. So it says on here that it's earth-friendly, and it save your ears, and uh, what is it? It is this thing that looks like a guitar pick, um, and uh, so you're going to get a pack of this. This is the one I opened and kept for myself, so this thing looks like a guitar pick. Look, this obviously, look, if you see online, there's always some YouTuber going, I love this $50 thick guitar pick, right? This is a thick guitar pick, but it's not. Here's what it is. In that pouch will be a, a case like this. In the case is tiny earplugs. Red is my size, so you'll know. There's black and white, and so there's three different uh, sizes. These are micro earplugs. They're actually earplugs, not ear filters, okay? So you put them in your ears, and they go back in the case. And why is that amazing? Well, now you have earplugs. I mean, come on. This is like a guitar pick. You put this in your little your little pocket, you know, in your in your in your pants or a little <laughs> right? Or you put it, you know, in your in your gig bag. This is awesome. I love this cuz I I have uh, all kinds of earplugs and ear filters, but they're usually the cases are pretty huge. Um, and this one actually comes with um, oh, and I, I forgot to tell you, it comes with three of those cases and three different size earplugs. So really cool. This is important because this is, uh, m February is Tinnitus Awareness, Awareness Month. So protect your ears. It's no excuse now. That's awesome. Thank you, Strandberg, so much. So really cool. So Strandberg, you're getting the, you're going to get the, 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 um, the earplugs. You're going to get the hat. You're going to get the water bottle. You're going to get the tuner. You're going to get some picks and stickers from us as well. And... I'm going to throw in one other thing for you, uh, and um, you're going to get an iron-on logo, and what that is is you can iron on the Know Your Gear logo. It's an, an, a logo, and it's a, you can put it on a shirt. It's a full-size shirt logo. You can put it on whatever you like. You just use an iron. It will come with instructions. My wife um, has my son cut these <laughs> out. So they're ready to ship to you, and she wrote up her the instructions herself and everything you need to know. You just take an iron. You can make yourself a Know Your Gear shirt. You can make yourself a Know Your Gear anything that you can. Anything that you can... Uh, apply like 350 degrees heat to for at least 15 seconds you can put this logo on it and it's amazing you can wash it 600 times it will never fade you can you can stretch it it's an amazing thing and it's going to be the neon logo full size like i said it's the size big enough to be a t-shirt or if you want to put it on the back of a of a shirt whatever you want um so i'm going to give you one of those too so that's the swag pack you just won all you have to do is just go to the um uh, know Your Gear podcast website and then hit the email link which will take you to ask Know Your Gear and uh, just let me know and uh, I will uh, get your address and, and Sean will get it out to you and uh, thank you for the question. So there you go. <laughs> yes, Brian, you can make a KYG speed Speedo. If you want to put it on your underwear, you can you can put it on your underwear. Like I said, whatever will take 350 degrees for 15 seconds, you can make. Um, she uh, worked really hard to get these um, made. Um, 
And uh, because we were having issues shipping some shirts to some countries and some places and people are having issues because it gets so expensive. So this is an alternative she's been working on. She's been sending them to the patrons. They've been giving her feedback on this. The feedback has been amazing. I have been giving her feedback. If I would have thought about it, I would have grabbed it. She, she did put them on some of my gig bags, but it is very difficult because a lot of gig bags have plastic and foam in them that can melt. But um, she uh, she did this because she can sh send this in an envelope anywhere in the world and you can just make your own t-shirt like that and it's quality. It's really good quality. So this is an alternative idea she's working on because of, you know, what people say, you know, it's, it sucks. I get it, man. I don't want to sell people $35, you know, t t a t-shirt with, by the time shipping's done, it's almost 35, 40 bucks. I only make like $5 if I'm lucky off the shirt. So, so what's worse is you're paying a fortune and you're not even really supporting the channel really financially a big chunk of that's not going to us so she's trying to find a way to make it more feasible to you guys and uh now officially you can make uh know your gear underwear <laughs> so there you go so that's your swag pack so there you go uh we need to get into more subjects <laughs> this is gonna go real fast all right here we go let's open this up let's drink water all right. Antique Rocker says, do repair shops have insurance to cover their screw ups? Question mark. My friend took his 1208 Gibson Les Paul, uh, Les Paul Modern, I'm sorry, to a local shop for setup and neck adjustment. They use, they use a cleaner that stripped the finish. Okay. So re repair shops and insurance. Okay. I'm not an insurance person, but obviously, like I said, I've been in I've had a repair business for many years. So you can get all kinds of insurance, but the in my case, the insurance we had was called owner insurance, okay? So um, let me, and here's why. So I can't uh, tell you about stuff I don't know about. So, so um, you can get all kinds of insurance, but what I had was a, a, a specifically a small business owner insurance, okay? Um, uh, for business owner. In fact, it's called business owner. I'm pulling it up right now. Business owner insurance policy. Um, and so it could, it would cover me cause I own the business. So I, I never used it. I never had to file a claim. I'd like to tell you that I never had made a mistake, but I did, but I would eat it because in a lot of cases, just like sometimes with car insurance and other things, you know, sometimes like, yeah, if you got $3,000 worth of damage, go ahead and file that claim. But if you have $700 in damage and your co pays $500 and they're going to give you $200 and then raise your rates, you just do it out of your, your own, uh, your own pocket. So a lot of times, it, you know, the thing I would be concerned about is like, you know, somebody bring me a $5,000 guitar, maybe some, you know, or more importantly, somebody, you know, a, a guitar that could not be replaced that that's where it gets scary with a repair. But, um, you know, if there was small things you could, you could do. Um, plus I had it very easy because I remember, uh, customers would come in and, uh, and ask me like, are you insured? Are you bonded insured? And I say, yes. And they go, you know, and I go, well, I guess we could show them the insurance policy. I'm sure. Um, but I remember one uh, guy in particular came in my store, uh, and he had a lollipop. I don't know why that matters to me, but it was just weird. There's just something about somebody who's like, so, you know, right? I'm like, uh-huh, and they go, and he's like pointing the lollipop at me, you know, I need a prop now. You know, I was like, kind of like, so, uh, you insured if I bring my guitar here? I'm like, yeah. And he goes, well, how much you insured for? I'm like, well, I wasn't going to tell him because <laughs> I didn't know, <laughs> but a lot, I don't know, more than I need. Uh, I said, uh, I don't know. I'm insured for everything. I, I mean, I, you know, I'm insured. And he's like, <laughs> and he goes, so if I bring my guitar and do something wrong to it, am I going to get covered? And you go, yeah. And he goes, how do I know? And I go, well, I own this place and all these guitars in the wall. I guess if I mess up your $2,000 guitar, you're welcome to take one of the $2,000 guitars off my wall. And he goes, okay. And he brought me three guitars. He went to his car and brought three guitars and I did his work. So, um, so I just remember that. So, um, so back to your story, there is all kinds of insurances. I think personally, um, I have not seen me personally, but doesn't mean it doesn't exist. I've not seen where like a person can just get a bonded insur insurance policy uh, f if they're like an employee of a business. Um, and I'm always weary, weary of that. You know, one thing that I don't like is some uh, businesses 
uh, make it seem like the repair person is connected to their business. And this is chains. And again, I don't know all the legalities and all the things, so I can't outright call you know certain businesses out. But um, I have asked these questions and not gotten answers. When you walk into a store, um, it is implied in my in my opinion, it's implied if I walked into a store and there is employees either in the back of the store or the side of the store, wherever they put them, there's people doing repair. Um, I think it's implied that that business would be liable for your damages. But I know for a fact that in your case, like what some stuff happens where you take it into a shop, somebody does the repair, messes up the entire repair, and then you go to the owner of the shop and they're like, no, they sub they sub rent the, the, the square footage. Um, we did not have that scenario in our business. No one was subletting from us. Everyone was getting paid directly by us. So whether you were a student of my business or you were a pair customer or you were buying from us, everything was encapsulated under my liability. Um, it's not the best business plan. It's the best person plan. That's how you, you know, these are the people in my community and these are the people I wanted to, res that, to respect me. So we did it that way. Plus my wife uh, does not uh, ever cut corners. So it's the right way to do it. So she set it up that way too. Um, but but um, some businesses can skirt liability insurance by sub con subcontract, some leasing people out. And I'm sure some attorneys are watching. I, I know there's a lot of attorneys that watch, especially that own really expensive PRSs. I'm just going for the joke, guys. I still love you. Anyways, um, and they're going to tell me that you can still sue those people, but I'm not talking about who you can sue. I'm talking about what they're going to tell you when you have the problem. So, um, and that's a question you may want to ask now, you know, now that this has come up, you know, if you go to a business, you're like, who is responsible for my instrument? Um, and, you know, and because it's realistic, especially if you're leaving product in their business. Um, uh, yeah, see, JB, thank you for saying it. I'll just repeat what JB uh, the second says. Guitar Center does that. Techs are not GC employees. I, I've asked this of Guitar Center and I didn't get anywhere with it. Um, I, no responses to my emails and nothing. The specific question I was asking, and I don't know the answer. So like I said, please don't take it as I'm telling you this. I'm, I'm telling you I have a question and I don't know an answer to it. I am a JB. What JB stated is what I understood too, is that you go to Guitar Center and what feels like the tech should be the Guitar Center's employee, so to speak. And if whatever happens, there should be Guitar Center's accountability. I've had numerous viewers to tell me that they've had a an issue. It happens. I'm not calling out Guitar Center by as an issue because it happens everywhere. It can happen anywhere. Um, but the issue happened. And when they went to Guitar Center, specifically like the manager of the store for the problem, they were like, well, that's not, that's not us. And I was like, that doesn't sound right. So I reached out to Guitar Center and asked if there's any clarification of how that works. And I got no response. That was a couple years ago. So anyone knows, especially Guitar Center, a lot of you Guitar Center employees, uh, especially repair techs, you know, watch this podcast, please reach out and let me know. Sometimes you guys give me some of the best information. It's not to out anybody or do anything. It's just to better understand it. I think, if you know, it's not about saying this is horrible or, or good. It's about exactly this how can you make sure that you don't get a situation like what's happening to him and his friend where his guitar finishes damage and you're not sure who's responsible and what the insurance is um so so that's um but uh i'm trying to think of advice for you in that situation besides just you know hey that sucks um in this case what i would say is um Let's see, what would what would I suggest you do? Uh, so they used a cleaner that stripped the finish. Well, you're really not giving me any feed or any more information. I'm gonna say I would I would definitely hold them accountable to some to some to some regard. I would basically say, like, what you know, what what can we get this fit, you know, taken you need to get it taken care of. And then um, and this is exactly the you know what we talked about. I just hate hearing these stories. You know, we talk about bad, you know, repair stories. I mean, I definitely would hold them to the fire on this. I would definitely see if there's, you know, especially if they did cause the damage. And at least if they didn't cause the damage, they need to be able to show you they didn't. Because I've been on both sides of that, so you know. I've been on the side where, um, you know, I did something and I go, hey, I called you and I, I called the customer and I go, hey, this happened, uh, you know, um, with the guitar. 
and you know this is uh what would you like me to do and i always have a couple suggestions i can replace it i can fix it i can do this i can make it to where i look like it never happened um so you know i uh I learned that from a really nice guitar tech that I met early on, and he was a really nice person, and um, and he taught me that. It was really great. What happened in this case, what happened was he dropped a screwdriver on a guitar, okay? So he was doing a thing, and it dropped, and it just went boop, little, little, nothing. And he was a Finnish guy, and he's like, so he calls the customer, and he's like, hey, I dropped the screwdriver. I can redo, the, I can fix it. You'll never even know it's there ever. And the customer's like, no, I don't, I, no. I want it replaced. So he replaced the guitar and then he fixed the, the damage and you couldn't find it. It was crazy. And then he sold the guitar. That's how I got involved with him is he had me help help sell the guitar. So we, we consigned it in the store. And, um, and he told me the story and I was and I had to ask. I'm like, obviously, I mean, there's no way anyone could tell. Your work was flawless. So I go, so I'm just curious why you just didn't fix it and never tell the customer. And he goes, that wouldn't be right. And I was like, you know, he's right. It's, I just, but there was a small part of me for a second going, yeah, I mean, no harm, no foul, right? I mean, if the customer never knows the problem ever happened. But then his point was I took it and luckily I kind of adopted that too. So um, and anyways, like I said, so I've been on that side and I've also been on the side where I didn't do the damage, but they thought I did damage. And in that case, you do what's great for your business, which is, you just take care of the customer the best you can and try to keep them as rational as possible. Cause sometimes, you know, it's tough when they're upset and you're like, you know, and especially when, you know, sometimes they're wrong really, really badly. <laughs> it happens, man. You know, um, what's the saying I, I like, I heard a long time ago. It works. Uh, it says the customer, there's a saying the customer's always right. And I forgot who said it. Uh, it doesn't matter. They said the customer is not always right, but the customer is always the customer. And I go, yeah, you know what? We'll go with that. The customer is always the customer. And they're your advertisement, negative or positive. They, they're going to take it to the streets. So if you're not going to take care of them, get ready for your horrible ad, <laughs> ad campaign, so to speak. Not Okay, you get the idea. Okay, so Maddie says, hey, Phil, too much to explain the entire scenario, but you were correct on the Shawbuckers resistance wiring. Thank you. So thank you, Maddie, for telling me about that. Last week, his question was about he had some Shawbuckers, and basically they were supposed to be putting out about 7K, and they were putting out about half of that, and I said that it happens sometimes where they mislabel the wires. In other words, the wires are not correct, uh, correctly soldered to the right other wires, and the colors are throwing off, and there's intestine, and so obviously that worked. Thank you, uh, Maddie, so much. And like I said, Maddie, I appreciate that because I'm pretty sure I said, and I always say this to you guys, like with Fred Flintstone, you don't have to super chat me again if you ask me if the if the advice worked or didn't work. Just send me a message and I'll filter. I want it. So Fred, I got his through um, through uh, the email. So again, Maddie, thank you for the super chat. But I, you know, you don't need to super chat me again. Um, uh, I I I think the audience and I am really curious to know this uh, how it worked out, good or bad. Like I said, and if it doesn't work out for you guys, don't be afraid. <laughs> Just tell me it didn't work. Believe it or not. That actually, one, may be more entertaining for most people. My failures are sometimes more entertaining than my successes. But most importantly, um, I'm try I've am i been trying over the years. You know, I'm, I'm verbally giving you answers to stuff I can't see. So I'd like to know how close we're hitting. Um, Mr. S says, dogs are so such sweet souls. I hope yours is doing better. Like I said earlier, thank you, Mr. S. Yes, the dog is doing much better uh, on the new meds, which is great. And... Uh, uh, you know, say, I, I see when I said much better. I, okay. I was maybe lying. He's doing better. Um, it's a little tough when it's been a little tough for us on the new meds. Um, he, uh, gets the, 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 these are like narcotics. They make him super hungry. He's like, he's like, a. It's like having a stone friend with the munchies 24 seven, except for this stone friend is like going to eat anything. <laughs> so we have to keep all food uh, locked up every at every moment. Uh, my wife made a pot roast. This, maybe this is funny for you guys. I don't know. My, my wife made a pot roast yesterday and we had to literally stand guard. I'm not exaggerating. Somebody had to be in the room watching the pot roast, even though it was on the crock pot in the back of the, you know, the countertop. Um, because he's so determined to get any food he can. So uh, my son even had to come for three hours while my wife went on an appointment and I was filming content. It's like we had we have to keep <laughs> a watch of all food, even for a second, um, because he'll uh, he'll get it. He'll eat it. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, 
Yes. Uh, Vim69 says, Phil, really enjoyed the Music Nomad S file video. Uh, my file arrived in the mail the same day you released the video. Perfect timing. So that video you guys haven't seen. Um, the patrons and members were given that video early. As you guys know, I released some videos early. There'll be a lot of videos coming soon, and that's one of the fi files. I bought the... Um, the new Music Nomad S file. Uh, it was one of those things, as soon as I saw it, I was like, okay, this is either, you know, talk about a product that felt like one of those late night infomercial, right? <laughs> right? What's that tape that everybody's always talking about, right? That super tape. Like, it was just one of those products, like this is either the best thing ever or it's garbage, right? Like, I just knew it was gonna go either way. And um, wow, wow, it's really cool. It's gonna, it's gonna change things. I, I sound so dramatic, right? I sound so dramatic when I'm saying anything, but it's going to change things. So you guys know. Um, so, uh, so if you guys don't know, you can Google it right now. It's called the Music Nomad Safe Zone file, and it's a really interesting idea. I put it, of course, through the paces, and uh, and I gave some some really serious feedback on it, and comparative to some of the files I like was as a Stu Mac, and uh, and yeah, somebody says Flex Seal Tape. Thank you, Flex Tape. Uh, and uh, I, I absolutely uh, hope you guys enjoy the video when you guys see it. And uh, I refined it a little bit after the patrons. So that what happens is the patrons and the ch members get to see it first because they give me feedback on it. And sometimes the feedback is like, I don't understand this clip. You said this, or I don't, it would be really nice if I could see that a little closer. So I have to go back and refilm something and edit it. Um, so you guys will see it really soon. And uh, wow, uh, yeah, interesting. Like I said, could be, could be a uh, industry changing tool. As silly as that sounds, but it's true. So for good or bad, uh, by grace, I'm saved says happy Friday, Phil. Thanks for your time, talent. I don't have any talent, but thanks for the, the t I'm giving the time and sharing your knowledge. What bass amp wattage would you suggest for a band practice and playing live? We talked about this last week too. I don't, I, I talked about this, uh, it, last week when I was saying that, uh, you know, you, you want to, for me, just to keep things easy, you, I would, I timestamp last week. So go back to it too. Cause I'll go into more detail, but for this one, uh, for now, just let me hit you with, um, I really like 200 to 500 Watts class D power for most gigs with a, at least a 12 inch speaker. But if you got a 210, a 410 or a 115, even better. So with bass, I don't, you don't need a huge rig any, you know, in my opinion, unless you're playing, you know, metal rocks arenas. But what you do need is you need to have enough frequency, a low end frequency and power and force to fill your area of space with sound. And it's really because it's not because I think you should be loud when you're a bass player. Um, one thing that I notice with bass players and I noticed it with myself and other bass players is that when, if you hit a note, if that note decays, it doesn't feel your fill, fill, F-I-L-L, -L, the space you have with sound, you're really easy to go to another note. And then that's when you start seeing busy bass players. You know, they're just playing a lot of notes uh, for no reason. It's because they're trying to fill the space. And sometimes, you know, you just want that, uh, the bass, they let the bass amp do the work. That's what I basically have, have, have used for many years uh, playing with musicians is I like the bass amp to do all the heavy lifting of the sound. Let that, let that, let that do all the stuff. I don't need to be doing a lot of technical stuff. Um, the guitar players really appreciate it when you don't do that, by the way. <laughs> they, they like it. Um, I've gotten more gigs and more musicians asking me to play with them because I'm not doing too much. I'm just sticking to the, the basics. Um, in fact, it is super common for me, which is the best, the best uh, uh, accolade I get is most musicians that play with me, guitar players, will tell me, you know, you could have done a little more, you know, you could have done a little solo, solo there. You could have done, you could do more. I'm like, oh, I could have done more. I always think that's the best uh, uh, compliment I could get because um, there's a fine line between do a little more and don't do a little bit more. <laughs> so I'd rather them tell me it was, it was adequate and I wasn't all over the place. Uh, Unplayed video game says, do guitar strings expire once strung up on a guitar? Kinda, we'll talk about that. Uh, say they put on a guitar and it's not played for a year. Uh, if you pick it up, will the strings still be like new? No, they won't. Now, granted, will they be bad? No, not necessarily. It depends on your environment. I live in a very dry climate. Um, earlier, we were talking about somebody saying they had 20% humidity. Arizona, I could have 5% humidity in the house. It's not uncommon. 
Um, although my humidity in this room is exactly 48% right now because of how I have the room set. Um, but it's, um, oh, it's because it's raining like crazy. <laughs> like, yeah, like how I got the room set. It's like, raining like crazy in Arizona. Um, so dry climate helps, of course. Um, wiping your strings. I know you said not, you know, using the string sitting on the guitar, but still, if you play your strings even one time, the oils, the dirt, and your string, or skin, that gets on your strings. Um, but let's go with the easiest scenario for you, unplayed video games. You restring your guitar with a, a set of strings that I think are quality, like Ernie Ball or Daddario or String Joy or you name it. Restring the guitar and hang it on the wall and let it sit. In one year when you pick it up, it will. they will not be expired but they will not sound as bright and as good as they did the day they were put on they'll be usable you mean you know guitar players can you can play strings as long as you like the way they sound however some people have very acidic skin and some people are sweaty and all kinds of things can make the strings corrode even faster but more importantly corrode to the point where they do break and so um so in you know, in that case, it's different. But in your case, um, I will tell you this, and I've talked about this in the past, so I'll just say it again. So I use Daddario or Stringjoy strings. Those are the two strings I like um, because, if I said this before, I like the owners of those companies. I like the people of those companies, and I like the quality they, they put forth. I don't have an issue with anybody else's strings. So if somebody says I like Boomers or I like, you know, JHS or if I like uh, 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 DR. By the way, I should point out, I do use DR strings for bass. So I do use DR strings for bass because I like their stainless steel bright strings. And then for guitar, I use Daddario or String Joy, except for guitars I know I'm never going to play. So I do have a few guitars that it's not about, um, uh, I you know, uh, you know, some guitars I play because I have different tunings. Some guitars I play for different sounds. But some guitars I just have because I just like to have them. They're on the wall and they're art. And they make me feel good when I see them and pick them up, strum a few chords. I put coated strings on those guitars. Most of the time I'm using Daddario coated strings, but I really don't care if it's Elixir or whatever. It's whatever I buy it that day. But I'll put coated strings on guitars that I know I never play for that reason because you pick them up a year later and they're going to still feel new. So if you do have a guitar and you know you're not going to use it very often, it's going to sit for long periods of time, I do recommend coated strings because you will get a huge amount of life out of them, especially if you're not playing them. Uh, they'll last where um, some strings will deaden to the point where it's not going to sound as good. Dan Brown says, just got a Kemper for $675 at a pawn shop. Did I make it out good? Any tips for the first time user? Um, I, I would think so, right? Um, my Kemper's the powered one. So I don't know you know, I don't know if you have the powered one or which one you have. $675 sounds like a good deal, I would say. Like I said, the deals are out there. So good job. Uh, it's a good unit. Um, I don't know anything about my Kemper. As I've, I've said before, It's uh, mine has essentially three or four of my amps, my personal amps, in it <laughs> and that's it and i have not actually adjusted or done anything to my kemper in i don't know when i got it i want to say two three years ago and i haven't done anything since and i use it every day so i um, i'm not i'm not really into the techie side of that stuff but i do like the technology so that's what i liked about the kemper it was easy to set up get done and then i leave it alone but i think you're gonna like it the kempers are really cool uh, the Juggernaut says, Phil, love the show. What do you think about staggered pole strat pickups? Okay, I'm looking at uh, some Duncan replacements. Why go staggered versus flat? Well, obviously, you know, a lot of the original staggered uh, pole pieces were because, again, they're trying to balance the, the, the tones, trying to make sure, uh, especially with single coils, it's really hard to get the highs and the lows uh, to sound very equalized, right? Um, they can get really... Um, they can sound like a boss pet, uh, uh, EQ pedal set, like a V, real quickly. Um, in fact, if you notice, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people who, uh, this happened when guitars started selling really strongly online. People would bring us, because we were a Fender dealer, all kinds of guitars, and they thought they had issues. And one of the issues was people would buy a new Strat, and the pickups were always like this. The the, the treble side of the pickup was always much higher than the bass side. And they're like, they're, why, they didn't lower it. They didn't make it flat. And I go, well, that's how you do a Strat. You kind of put the treble side closer to the strings than the bass side. Um, so the pole pieces, uh, you know, this is one of those things where, again, I'm going to go with, yeah, does it make a difference if they're staggered? It does. Does it, do I care? I don't like I, I, you know, if the pole pieces are staggered, if the pole pieces are flat, you know, I, I never really noticed a, a big difference. The pickups I make are, are staggered pole pieces, but it's mostly because I'm replicating a style of pickup that I liked and I just kept it easy. Keep it easy that way. Um, 
but I would never, I would, I've done the experiments so you guys know. I've taken the same exact pickup. I've pulled out the, uh, the stagger pole pieces, put the flat pole pieces in. Yeah, I guess there's a little bit of difference. <laughs> it's one of those things, like I said, where we, once you get in the one to 10% difference of sounds, it gets real hard to be passionate about that, you know? Um, so to me, if it's a little bit different, it can be a little bit better, even if it's one or 10% and it doesn't cost you anything to do it, do it. But if it's, you know, so that's why they, they do it. <laughs> Just to kind of equalize out the strings and the tone. And also keep in mind that a lot of things were done before amplifiers and technology had so much control of the sound. You know, a lot of stuff had to be established way before it got to the amp if you wanted it to happen. And now you can kind of manipulate the sound a lot more in depth with the technology we have now, whether it's even a tube amp, the technology on amps is so much better. Uh, Brian says, static issue on a pick guard. If my PRS Vela is, I've tried using static guard, but the issue keeps coming back. Is it a sign that it's a bigger issue? Um, no. Um, the static, uh, using static guard and putting on a cloth and stuff, removing the static, if it, it's a big issue if it doesn't work. But my guess is it worked. It took the static off and it came back. The reason it came back is because probably because there's no shielding inside the pick guard. Um, and again, the friction's happening on the pick guard. So one thing you can do to kind of take it to the next level is uh, insulate and shield the inside of the cavity. You can use shielding tape or shielding paint. Uh, and then go ahead and clean all the electronics and then go ahead and use the static guard again. And that should take care of it. That's a bigger issue. Somebody says there's a ground issue. Could be, but my guess is the ground issue would really be noticeable from the sound more so. So uh, although he could have a ground issue, it is possible, but my guess is the sound would be unbearable. He would hearing that hum. Uh, really, really badly. So it, now to ask you this, if you're having static issues and you're hearing a weird buzzing sound, then maybe a ground issue. But I would say go ahead and insulate the cavity and uh, and the pick guard and um, and then go ahead and do it again and see if that kicks it. Like I said, you, you got to, I always tell you do everything in stages. So first step, just kind of remove the static electricity with static guard. That fixes the issue. You're done. Um, when I showed that trick on a short video, I did it on my Delos, and somebody goes, oh, well, Phil, you need to shield your guitar. That is heavily shielded guitar, and it still did it. So the difference, though, in your situation with your Velo is mine did it on my Delos, and then once I wiped it, it never came back. So, uh, you know, and that happens, too. Um uh, Nick says, congrats on 350, Phil. Thanks for sharing your knowledge and making great content. Thanks to you. I have uh, i haven't paid anyone for guitar tech work in years, and I love doing the work. Here's it to another 350. Thank you so much uh, for the compliments, and I'm glad to hear that you're, you're not having to pay heavy uh, labor rates because you can do the work yourself. There's something very pleasing about that. Let me... Um, let me pay attention to the moderators real quick because they send me questions too. Let me grab a moderator question. Uh, and what do we have? Uh, uh, this one was sent to me. This is uh, by Amanda. Sent me Greg uh, question. Phil, any thoughts on Legator guitars and why there isn't much coverage online of them? Um, you know, this is the question that comes up a lot on the podcast. You know, have you heard of this brand and how come I haven't heard of this? You know, how come the, you know, there's not a lot of social media on this brand. Um, I, I've only inter interacted with Legator guitars once. And it was how, when I did the, how do you say your name? And they said Legator guitars. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, so, uh, that was it. And I've never, I've never reached out or anything and done anything. I don't know. I don't see them as, I don't think they do a lot of social media. Some companies do a lot of social media, as we've talked about. Those are very obvious who they are. It's everybody from Orangewood to Paul Reed Smith to, you know, insert uh, the Amazon brand of the month, you know, because they're trying to get, you know, market share. Fender does a lot of social media stuff. Um, and and then there are brands like we talked about that don't do any social media, which would be like Rickenbacker. <laughs> you know, it's one and a few other brands here and there. And, uh, and that's why I said, sometimes you just have to buy those to get them on the channel. I have to buy the guitars and put them on the channel. And, uh, and I don't mean buy them like how I buy a guitar for me personally, like I did the go Dan it's, I just buy it for the YouTube video. Um, Reverend was a company that was just not 
really working with the channel. So I bought some reverends and put them on the channel. And, uh, you know, and because you guys, same here. So Legator is one of those things. If you guys mention enough times, if I hear about it, if it's something I think you guys are interested in, I will definitely get that guitar and put it on the channel. Um, in, in a perfect world, I would love, uh, you know, to, to, to have the company approach me and have to do it through some kind of sponsor deal where they're sending me the guitar or doing something like that. And the reason I, I say that is because not every video has to be that. I definitely, I don't know what my percentage are, but I do a huge amount of non-sponsored content. The Music Nomad file I just did, um, actually, I should have said this. It just didn't come up, so I'm going to say it now. Um, that's not a sponsored thing. I, I bought a file and I did a video of it. Um, and I said that I didn't le release it yet. And actually, it's not, and I said because I'm still working on it, it's actually done. The reason I didn't release it to the main populace is the patrons bought all the, all the files. Uh, the patrons will tell you, if there's patrons here, they'll tell you right now that um, I released in the video, they gave me some feedback, and then um, I had a link to Sweetwater. Sweetwater's totally sold out of the files now. Um, so so making a video where basically, you know, everybody's going to go, well, they're not in stock. <laughs> okay. So um, hopefully they'll get in stock in the next couple of days and I'll release the video. So the reason I'm telling you that is that um, sometimes when I do videos, it's not that I need to be compensated by the company. It's just nice to have some kind of interaction with the company because they are going to sell a lot of product. We are all freaks for guitars, okay? I've told you guys before, I do the same thing you guys do. I watch a YouTube video. I watch Pete Thorne. And the next thing you know, I'm buying a pedal or something that Pete's talking about. And so I get it. We get excited when we see stuff. And so it's really nice if I have some kind of relationship since I'm really going to probably make them a lot of money. Um, and I don't mind it that way. Like I said, I have made now uh, 350 episodes. I'll, I can tell you this. This is what's crazy now being on YouTube. I have now made a dozen companies seven figures just for no reason. <laughs> I don't even know if I ever told you this cake story. If I anyone remember my cake story, did I ever tell the story about the cake? One day I'll tell this cake story. <laughs> I got a cake once for making a company million dollars. It was a really funny story. So, um, uh, <laughs> but it was a good cake. Uh, so anyway, so uh, so Legator. So um, my guess is maybe they don't do social media, and if they do, maybe they just don't work with uh, my channel. We'll, we'll see. Like I said, so. Um, one of my focuses for 2024 is to get more new brands on the channel, which means I've been buying more product, um, because of the fact that it's like one of the things that I get a little depressed about sometimes with the channel is, is that because you guys are so, I don't know what the word is, um, extreme, <laughs> uh, because we're extreme as a community, um, because I can talk about a guitar and you guys get crazy or a pedal and, uh, you know, and this happens to other YouTubers, I'm not special, but it's, but it is the environment we're in because I can do a video and all of a sudden a company make a lot of money off that video. A lot of companies come back and they come back and come back and come back. And although that's great and I think you guys like it and I like it, sometimes I get a little like weary of the whole, like this is the fifth time or the 10th time this brand's been on the channel and I haven't put any whole lot of other brands cause they don't interact with us and I can only buy so much. So, um, so again, I try to keep the variety up, uh, is what I try to do. In fact, um, there's like seven new brands coming in the next three weeks to videos that I'm excited about. They're never been on the channel before. And that was my main thing is try to get some different, fresh, fresh blood on the channel. Exciting things. Uh, so there you go. Um, let's look, I want to do something else for fun. Let's do this. I'm scanning. Remember, if you're trying to talk to me or you're asking a subject or question, put the question mark for. Um, okay, let's. Um, do, 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 do. Okay. Uh, winds surf Maui wind surf Maui says, why are, why are we getting ads in the middle of a live show that say sponsor? Uh, I thought the channel was sponsored by us. It's sponsored by patron, but that's the sponsor is patron. The ads are by YouTube. So YouTube puts the ads in. So how, you know, that's how it works too. So the ad list, uh, the ad, if you want no ads from YouTube, there's two ways three ways you can get no ads from YouTube. You can buy YouTube premium and um, you will get no ads from YouTube. And more importantly, on this channel, 
on my podcast, even though you, you pay for no ads on YouTube, I'm not integrating ads on this podcast. So if you guys watch any podcast, and I mean any podcast, you know that the first five, four or five minutes of a show can just be ad after ad that the person like me is just reading to you ad after ad after ad. And then in the middle of the show, it's like, hey, now it's, you know, now it's, you know, Shark VPN and right. So there's no, there's no ads. I'm not reading ads. Okay, there's no sponsorship. For instance, if it was not sponsored by Patreon, but sponsored by Sweetwater, you would be hearing at least one or two ads about Sweetwater throughout the show, regardless if you had YouTube Premium or not, because I'm reading the ads, which I absolutely hate, by the way. I hate that I pay for YouTube to get no ads, and then the person on the channel is reading the ads. However, when I say I hate it, I hate that it exists. I know why it exists, because you can't live off the ads off YouTube, and you can't live off the sponsorship. It's like, it's a million. it takes mi millions of these little quarter pennies to make any money. So you add it all up. Um, and so, so that's, that's that part. The, um, if you don't also want ads, you can get a, a, spa, a blocker, spam blocker, whatever. And sometimes that'll cut the ads out as well. The third option is if you are a supporter of the, of this channel, um, on Patreon or are on members, channel members, I give you a version of this show every week with no ad that doesn't have the ads. So there you go. That's how I do it. So I, I try to make is I try to make it as easy as possible. I'm not integrating ads into the podcast, and I'm giving the paid sponsor members a version without ads. And again, so if you don't want if you don't want to do those two things, I understand. Then you have to do either spam blocker or uh, thing. And I have no control of now the fact that YouTube's getting more aggressive with the ads, and it's just getting that way. I have Netflix, and Netflix is now playing ads. So I mean, I get it, man. It sucks. I'm with you too. Okay, but. Uh, and if there's ever a day <laughs> where I'm making the kind of crazy money that some of these big YouTube channels make, trust me, I will definitely shut all that stuff down because it won't. I won't worry about all the pennies. Um, but right now, all the pennies make the dollars, and so the dollars accumulate that way. So here, that's how it works. Um, so, uh, so uh, I hope that helps. Makes sense. But yes. And I, I know it sucks that they put them in the middle of the live show, but I don't know how, you know, like I said, it's just YouTube does it and it says, do you want ads or not? The only thing YouTube gives me control of is how crazy the ads can get. Like I can, believe it or not, there's like next levels up. <laughs> and I've said this story before. I accidentally clicked one of the normal like ad uh, click things that I did. I, I don't know how to explain it, but when you're creating your show, it says how many ads you want. Not numbers, just how aggressive you want to be. If you go medium or heavy, um, the one time I clicked it, it gave you guys 16 ads in the first like 15 to 20 minutes. Like, and I'm not kidding. It's like one every, it wasn't even one every minute. Cause it's like the first four minutes had like five or six ads. And so everybody's like, what the hell's going on? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> and I had to fix it. So now I just keep it as a lower number, but it's, it still sucks. I, I I'm with you. I'm with you. Maybe we'll get there one day and I'll just do no ads at all on the podcast. But, but you know, like I said, man, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe that's what I'll figure out. Maybe there's a number we can get to. Um, I can tell you this. Sponsor sponsors, company sponsors, if we stopped the patron sponsorship deal and did company sponsors, I would not have to run ads on the show because the companies will pay a lot more. There's a lot more. Trust me, the, you know, companies will pay a lot more to get access to your this audience, you guys, than the, the patrons supporting the channel. But I think that's why patrons and members do it. It's because they don't want me to read a six minute Sweetwater or Sam Ash or, you know, uh, Chase Bliss or whatever companies add, you know, they don't want me to read that. So, so there you go. Um, but we'll always work it out. I'm always trying to figure out the best way to do this stuff. I'm always trying to figure out, you know, the way to make a living and then, but have a community that I, cause I, I value you guys and I don't want you guys to be upset with stuff. So, all right. Um, but so you know, and just very, very clear for everybody else, I like questions like that. When people ask questions like that, you should ask questions like that because it gets me thinking like, I don't know. Like I said, I have to look. So I'll look at the numbers. Um, the uh, the 11 says, keep it as pure as possible. I can't imagine I'm ever going to, no, I can't imagine I'm ever going to do like the sponsored podcast thing. This is This podcast really needs, mentally for me, it needs to be as, community-based as possible. I can't turn it into a, a, a video ad show. It just will, it will emotionally, I, I know I won't handle it. 
So I know how it works. If I can get more money per show, that'd be great, but I'll do a lot less shows because I just won't want to do it. It's how it works, man. You got to, you know, I tell you guys, one of the things that bums me out every week is I want to just sit and read your guys' comments more than I want to talk. <laughs> um, so let's see. Uh, uh, okay, Adrian's question. Uh, Adrian, if you're listening right now, it says, uh, Adrian says, Adrian R says, my Rosewood fretboard is pretty rough. How would I go about smoothing it out? Sandpaper question mark, steel wool? Thanks and love the show. So I would use steel wool. You can use triple lot or quadruple lot steel wool. And in my experience, both start with triple lot, go to quadruple lot. It doesn't really matter either way. Um, you, reason why I say that, obviously take some painter's tape, cover up your pickups, make sure none of the steel wool gets on your pickups or anywhere you know uh, there. A lot of people are going to tell you not to use this, but I, I'm going to tell you why I want you to use it, um, especially if you tape up the areas and keep it good. But... The reason why I like it is because it's super easy to polish out your fretboard with it and it polishes your frets. If your fretboard is so bad, maybe you need like 400 grit sandpaper and you need to kind of smooth it out um, and don't do your frets. Um, you can if you use the, you know, if you use a, a foam block like that 400 grit with a foam block and you can go over your frets and your sandpaper, but you're going to then need to repolish your frets up. Um, but that would be if it's really extremely rough. And like I've told you guys before, remember it's your tongue, your ears, and your fingertips are very sensitive. So what you perceive sometimes is really rough because uh, I have the same problem sometimes when I'm bending on a fretboard and I'm like, man, it feels like, <laughs> maybe these are like craters between the grain, right? And it's, just, it's like, it feels like I'm running with my fingers on sandpaper. You realize that it's not that extreme. So a little bit of triple lot steel wool, like I said, go, and you go, I go, I go from, <laughs> oh, I'm going to say it. I go from, <laughs> I go from the, from nut to, <laughs> anyways, nut towards the bridge. Uh, so anyways, I just go lengthwise on the fretboard across and I just go across everything and let it polish everything up. Um, I'm a real big proponent for broken in feeling necks. So, um, especially if there's no finish on the back of the neck or anything for you to worry about, um, I just go over everything, the side of the fretboard with it, the top of the fretboard, over the frets, over the side of the frets. I just kind of let it go crazy and I'll just do it very vigorously, vigorously and just kind of feel it. And it's, uh, and it's cheap, right? I mean, steel wool is cheap and it's, and it's easy to use. And uh, like I said, other than you do you want to make sure that it doesn't get anywhere near your pickups or anything else where it can gather up. Uh, and, um, that's, uh, what I would recommend. Um, let's see. Um, now see, Dan is saying he uses the green scotch bright. If you're going to use a scotch bright, uh, scotch, uh, uh, this is what I would use. Um, and here, I'm going to tell you why. Um, there's a reason why. Um, okay. Um, give me one second, guys. I just want to get the exact. There we go. Okay. So I'm pulling it up on uh, Stu Mac. As I've always tell you guys, anytime you want to learn or find anything, go to Stu Mac. You don't have to buy it from Stu Mac, but they're an amazing resource to get the actual product you want, not a fake product or a weird variation of it. Learn the right product and then you can go buy it on wherever you want to buy. So let me share this with you. So the pad, um, you mentioned the th green pad. Let me just show you. As I'm just going to tell you this so you guys, again, just so you know. I've now been to 36 factories and shops around the world, and I've seen how they build guitars. And I can tell you the majority of them will be using steel wool, so you know. But the other majority, like Gibson, uh, use the white 3M scotch pad, this right here. So it, you can see here in this picture, exactly like that. See how they tape it off? They're using it on the frets. You can use this. This this pack is interesting right here. Set of three, you'll get um, the you'll get the gray. There's the gray. You'll get the brown and the white. But if you want, I can take you back to Amazon. Here's a pack of them for 16 bucks. Uh, is it 3M? See. And you don't have to use the 3M brand, but I just like to stick to the brands, like 3M and stuff. So 3M, the white ones are what you want. Uh, if And here's why I like this. The reason I tell you guys this. You, a lot of people are going to have advice for you, okay? Um, 
I like to stick to advice that are in two categories, things I've absolutely done a hundred times or a thousand times so that when I advise it to you and you tell me how wrong it was, I'll know something went wrong, not just my advice. Like maybe you didn't execute correctly or, and I can help you if you email me and go, Phil, I did what you said and it didn't work. I know it's going to work because I've done it. The other kind of advice I like to give is the things I've seen a hundred or a thousand times, like at a factory or something like that, or another guitar tech or another luthier. And I go, okay, these things are practical. They've been done before millions of times over. And so I feel pretty good. So in this case, I have used the white 3M Scotch Bright pads and I've seen them used. Um, I I've told you guys, I'm a creature of my habit. I used steel wool for a long time. As you guys know, I love micro mesh. I use that stuff too, but I just used it for so long. It's so cheap and so easy. Why not have it? And most people have it. They just have it around their house. So you can use that as well. Um, yeah, Richard said the 3M is expensive. And that's why I like to give multiple suggestions, okay? Multiple suggestions. The other reason I have to give different layers of advice is what's important is, is that I try to give advice that I would use. And unfortunately, because most of my experience is working on people's guitars, my advice is going to be giving a, uh, I'm going to do things the absolute best way possible because I want, it's a customer's guitar. I treat their guitar like it's the most important thing in the world because it is to them, you know, uh, you know, people talk about $3,000 guitars. Notice I never say like, oh, I use a 3M Scotch-Brite pad on a $6,000 guitar, but on a Squire, I'll use steel wool. No, I've never experienced that in my, all my years of doing repair that an expensive guitar correlates to a customer who's got more higher standards. People... The more they love the guitar, the more it matters. And loving a guitar has, doesn't have a price point. So, um, so I, like I said, I, I always recommend a, an inexpensive way and an expensive way. But those two ways are really good. Um, and uh, and uh, those will both work. So there you go. Two, two ideas right there. Use them. Don't use them. Uh, let's see. Um, Uh, B Mac says, I have a 55 reissue custom shop. I think see you telly, see you telly. So I think that's, I don't know, $5,000 and I hate the neck. Oh, that sucks. Too big, chunky neck. Sure. 55 reissue neck is going to be a chunky neck. Is it okay to replace the neck with a modern C type neck thinner without hurting my custom shop? Telly, I'm, I'm see you, Telly. Uh, simple swap for my luthier. Thanks. Yeah, it's a simple swap, and you absolutely can do it. I've talked about this many times. That's the best thing. Remember, Leo Fender invented this guitar for you to do exactly that. Is that when your neck went, you know, your frets went bad, you get a new neck. Uh, if you don't like that neck, you swap the neck. So definitely do that. Like I said, you could take the original neck off. You put it in the box that the new neck's going to come in, or in a nice box, pack it up, put it away, safe, dry place in a closet somewhere in your house, and uh, play the new neck and have enjoy the guitar forever. And if you ever sell it, swap it back. No problem with doing that at all. It's pretty straightforward. Um, it's one of those things. You can take it to your local repair tech luthier and do it, or you can do it yourself and see how it works out. This is one of those things, again, you have to you have to decide your comfort, comfort level with you. Um, what I would tell you is it's very easy to do, and you could probably do it, and it'll work out great. And if it doesn't, if you take it to a tech, and if they're worth their grain of salt as a, as a luthier or a repair tech, uh, they'll just fix what you did. It's an easy fix. It's something that sh they shouldn't look at and go, oh, you put the neck on this? Oh, now I got to charge you double. It should be like, okay, what? I'll get it set up for you and dial it in. And if they don't talk like that, leave. Go find somebody else. Like I said, um, it's, it's you know, it's I'm telling you, it's not that hard to do. Like I said, you can do it. And if you do it a little bit wrong, it shouldn't be hard to make it right, the rest of the way right. So that helps. Um, let's... Uh, what are we doing? We need a, I need a, I don't know what I need. I need something. Um, Uh, Steve, Wright, Steve Wright wants to know, did Heritage fix the issue with the frets? I notice a semi-hollow in the background. Uh, oh, that's my, yeah, my PRS semi-hollow. Uh, the Heritage, I need to follow up with them and see where we're at with that. Um, I, so I've just, uh, so if you guys don't know, I've been, uh, I've talked about this. Heritage sent out a beautiful guitar. So um, it's an amazing instrument uh, that they sent out. 
Um, but there are a couple things I'm just not bonding with the instrument about. And these were things that I, these were criticisms that I had that, um, that Tim Pierce agreed. Uh, we didn't even talk to each other. We didn't even know, but we talked after and found out that we were both dealing with heritage and had the same criticisms. And so I reached out to heritage and, um, I'll just tell you guys so you guys know. Um, it was a really difficult thing. I told the patrons about the story. I'm going to tell you guys now and because I really want you to know um, how why it was a difficult thing. Heritage sent out this amazing H150 custom shop guitar. It's like a $4,000, $5,000 guitar. Uh, Heritage reached out. They're a beautiful company, uh, as we all know, and they reached out and said, hey, we saw on the podcast, um, we saw, you know, we love your podcast. We'd like to send you a guitar. Um, and we were talking about earlier about companies that, you know, do social media versus not. They obviously want to engage in social media. As you guys probably saw, they sent like Aggie Fish. They sent a ton of YouTubers guitars. I got the guitar and I can tell you, um, if you guys watch Tim Pierce's uh, reaction to his heritage guitar, I can also absolutely confirm some of the things that he, my experiences are the same. The pickups are some of the best pickups I've ever heard. Uh, the heritage guitar sounds amazing. The It plays like butter. It is beautiful beyond all. I have a Gibson R9, and when I sit them next to each other and people come over, the R9 looks pathetic. It looks really sad. And I picked that R9 <laughs> like because it's a good-looking guitar, but their, their top just really set it off. And the only thing is the critique I had was had to do with the frets and not the fret size, but just how the frets were done. And... Interesting enough, as you guys, if you guys watch uh, Tim Pierce's video, he had his fret, his refretted. Um, I I reached out to Heritage and um, I let them know that I could do the video, but I'm not in love with the guitar and that, you know, we can send it back. And uh, I'm just going to tell you because I told the, uh, uh, the patrons already know the story. Uh, my friends, my close friends were like, are you kidding me? <laughs> They're like, you're going to send this $5,000 guitar back? And I'm like, well, I mean... I don't know how, I don't, you know, I like it, but I mean, if I'm not going to play it, uh, you know, I mean, I could do a video of it, but I mean, it's not, you know, I'm not going to play it and I don't feel comfortable taking a guitar from a company. I'm not going to, I'm not going to love and play. Like I said, I, it's not like the guitar was given. Some companies will send you a guitar as compensation because they don't, they don't want to pay for a, a, a sponsored video. So they send you a guitar and then they, it's kind of like understood that you'll have it for a little while and then maybe sell it when you're done with it because that's how you're going to get your money back for paying for your time. This wasn't the deal I had with Heritage. Heritage sent me the guitar because they want me to play it. That happens with some companies. And in that case, I'm going to tell you right now, I tell companies all the time, either no, I'll do the one-time video and then we'll either give it away or we'll, you know, sell it or whatever or I'll send it back. But in this case, I really wanted to keep it. And so, um, and so Telly Driver says, were the frets crowned wrong or something? It's, it's not about that. There, it, it, it's, and this is the part I'm being vague. I'm not trying to cover up anything. You just understand that there's, I, I kind of sent them my theory, what was happening. And I kind of got the impression the response was I was right. Um, so I have, and I had a nice suggestion for a fix. And so they have been, they were very open to this idea and uh, they're going to get back with me. At some point, one of two things will happen for sure. Okay. They'll either, um, they'll either, will either come up with this new idea and this new thing. And then I'll share that with you. Of course, this story has been told. So I'm going to tell you guys this story, of course. And then, or if they don't do it, I will review the guitar as it sits and you'll learn everything about the guitar, the good and bads, which is mostly 90% good. And if you're looking at a heritage right now, I don't even know, and I would say this in the video as well, I don't even know that if nine out of 10 of you would even notice or have any issues that I'm having with it, but it's just important that I did have them and Tim Pierce had them too. And it was, it's the fret, it's some, it's the fret size. It's just too small. And it's not that it's, it's a little hard to explain. We're not going to go into it on a video like this because I would really like to illustrate it because like I said, it's important that they get the, the credit they deserve. They, um, as you know, some companies uh, could easily just said, fine, send the guitar back, screw, <laughs> right? Screw off. Um, no, they really want to solve this um, and see if they can improve and see if I can, you know, be happier and, uh, 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 Leland says, how light was it? It's super light, man. It's like seven and a half pounds. It's awesome. So like I said, I love the guitar. Let me put it this way. Uh, Tim Pierce had his refretted. I would definitely refret mine and it would be the most perfect guitar I've ever had in my, in, of Les Paul I've ever owned with, without a doubt. But I would like to get somewhere 
not there. That's not the answer I'd like to give you guys, which is, hey, get this guitar for this crazy money and then refret it and you're going to have the best guitar ever. Uh, I don't think that's very practical. It's practical for me because they sent me the guitar. It would not be practical if I spent four or $5,000 on it. It just couldn't. I couldn't do it. Just like you guys. I couldn't spend that money and do the, the you know, the refret. It wouldn't, wouldn't make sense. So we'll talk about it more. Like I said, just uh, I'm giving you updates on it. Um, the the good news is it will resolve very quickly. Like I said, the, the, the video, something will be done and we'll talk about it. But overall, still impressed. Still impressed. Um, yeah, Elder Deuterino says, if Phil and Tim uh, advise you on something, you know, and this is the important part. It was really scary. And Tim, Tim to, you know, Tim's, Tim's ethics, you know, is is so amazing. He's such an amazing guy. And, uh, and, and please understand what I'm saying when I say it's tough. It's a tough thing. It's so easy, right? It's so easy when a company sends something out and it's great and you're like, Oh, it's great. And they're like, Oh, cool. Um, but it's tough to give the feedback when it's not great. Um, you know, but you have to, you owe it to yourself, you owe it to them and you owe it to viewers to give the most accurate feedback. Even if, even if, like I said, just because it's my feedback doesn't mean it's the truth. It's just my opinion, but it's my opinion. It's important that it gets, you know, that it, so I, that's why I took the route I did. Um, and we'll talk about it more. Let's, let's do something fun. Uh, here's what we're going to do fun. I'm going to, kind of, I'm cru cruising right now. Uh, Hero Glop's got a question. I just want to do this. Hero Glop says, Hey, is EHX, uh, Electro Harmonics, a brand that YouTubers don't like? Question mark. Not many demos. Uh, the new Spruce Goose and Affordable BB pedal has only a couple of videos on YouTube. Were those sponsored videos or are those the people buying the pedals? I remember I don't get a whole lot of pedal demos, man. They don't really, I'm not really in the pedal, uh, m view, you know, the pedal companies don't really see my channel very often. I don't do a whole lot. As you guys know, I, I just started reviewing some of my personal pedals because companies don't send me pedals. So, <laughs> so <laughs> um, which is fine. It's, uh, you know, it's fine, but it's just saying I'm, I'm a little out of sorts on the pedal, uh, thing, you know, right. I'm, I'm mostly interact with mostly the guitar companies, the tool companies and the amp companies. It's because of the content. The irony is you put out a lot of content that cause companies like send me a guitar and I do a video about a guitar and then another company see that video and they want to do a video of a guitar. The pedal companies don't really see on the radar. I don't know much about, uh, the electro harmonics other than I really like their product and I like their price points and I own a bunch of their pedals. Well, I've owned a bunch of their pedals, but my, uh, mini big muff is still one of my favorite pedals that I still have. And I love, so um, uh, there you go. Um, uh, where is what I'm looking for? Warren said, did somebody win the blue belt tone? I looked today. I didn't see the uh, announcement of the owner, uh, the winner announced. Um, so if you guys are curious about the blue, the bell tone guitar, um, definitely check, uh, bell tone guitars. I will, I will check right now <laughs> in real time. Let's do it uh, to see if they posted anything on Instagram. And and I have not seen anything posted yet, but I will announce it as well. Um, what I can tell you is I have not shipped the guitar. Um, Steve at Beltone will be sending us a label to who to ship this guitar to. So obviously I was not sent a label to... so. Um, but once that's announced, I will also tell you guys too. So we know we get that out there and then I'll let you know probably next week if I shipped it. And if I did, who, who did I ship it to? Cause I'll, I'll have their name, at least their first name and last name to tell you. Um, okay. Um, oh, Brian says bell tone is Sunday, I think. Oh, so is there still time to enter? So if there's still time to enter, you can still try to win the bell tone guitar. I don't have it here. It's downstairs in the case ready to get shipped. I started boxing it up and getting ready. Um, okay. We need to do another giveaway. Let's do a giveaway right now. The, the, uh, another quick pack thing. Um, let's do something fun. All right. Here's the fun thing. So I told my wife, I promised to do something funny. So here's the funny thing I'm going to do. I'm going to play you something 
And then the first person to tell me the real name of the company is winning a swag pack. Ready? Today's episode is sponsored by Moon Pie Guitars, because the guitar you have sucks. What is the real name of that company? The Moon, the moon Pie. What is the name of the Moon Pie Company? By the way, we're never making fun of that company. We're making fun of a story that I told a few years ago about a guy who said the name of the company and we couldn't remember what he said. Does anyone know the name? It could be anyone, but you got to be in the U.S. I got to ship this to you. If you're outside the U.S., you can still try to win, but there you go. Donald. No, sorry, Donald. The real Christopher Ryan. He is one second faster. Christopher Ryan. Moonstone is the company. Again, we're not making fun of the company. Don't take that. Some guys like Moonstone guitars are great. Why do you make fun of them? We're not making fun of Moonstone. We're making fun of a customer I had that told me all guitars that weren't Moonstone were mediocre and crap. And then years later, we couldn't remember what he said. And we've always referred to him as Moon Pie Guitars. Christopher, the real Christopher Ryan, please email me. Go to uh, the Know Your Gear podcast website and email me and let me know. You just won a bunch of cool stuff. Let me show you again because I want to show it to you. You're going to get a Strandberg trucker hat. This is Strandberg in the green, which is cool. You're going to get a Strandberg water bottle that also says Strandberg. <laughs> Thank you again to the Strandberg guys for sending this stuff. You're going to get a snark because the guys at snark sent us some snarks. And as you know, we've been giving these away. You're going to get a $30 rechargeable snark. You're going to get some stickers that say know your gear because that's the name of this channel and some pics that say know your gear. That's important. And then you're going to get the most amazing thing ever from Strandberg again, which is these earplugs that are so tiny, they fit in this little case that is the size of a thick guitar pick. And you get three of these cases and three different sets, small, medium, and large, depending on how big your ear holes are. And then if you're curious, when you get yours, uh, my ear holes are the red. So there's red, see there's red little, <laughs> red, black, and white. Red is what feels good to me. This is how tiny these earplugs are. Look how tiny they are. They go right there. So, that's awesome. And uh, and because I did it to the other person as well, you're going to get a iron on Know Your Gear uh, logo that you can make a shirt or underwear or socks, anything that you can that can take uh, 350 degrees for 15 seconds or so. Um, you can uh, iron this on and it will it's an amazing uh, product that goes on any shirt, anything and it's there. So there you go. You just won that. Please contact us uh, for the giveaway to say thank you guys for 350 episodes. So he says ear hole. Okay, so let's do this. I want to do something else. Let's uh, finish this, this, some of this cool stuff up, okay? Uh, this is uh, from Grumpy Mike Guitar who says, uh, thanks to you, I think I'm going to have to buy a new crowning file. All of a sudden, I'm not as happy with the one I have. You know, that was a question I got asked uh, for you guys about that uh, safe zone file. Would I, uh, re if I, or if you already had the Z file or other files, would you sell it to get this? Uh, you know, that's, I, I'm too practical of a person to say yes. In other words, you know, when I have something that works, it's even if I want something better, it's hard for me to get that unless I can sell the old thing or somehow, you know, go. So, um, if you have a good file and you're happy with it, stick with it. Um, but if you're in the market, I would definitely check that file out. Uh, Mike Coffee says, hey, Phil, why don't people talk more about Roland Jazz Chorus amps? I have a Jazz Chorus 40, and it's a fantastic with great effects. Very clean. Jazz Chorus is a legendary amp, of course. The, the Roland Jazz 120, of course, was the like the iconic one. It's been used on albums. Even, even uh, everybody from the guys in Limp Bizkit use it to actual jazz musicians. Nuno Bittencourt, I think, told me once that he ran like a, a an ADA through a Jazz Chorus. I thought he was saying that. I can't remember. Maybe he said a Fender Twin, and, I, and I'm thinking of somebody else, the Jazz Chorus. And, of course, now that they have the Jazz Chorus 40, it's a great amp. It's one of those amps I've always thought about getting, the, the 40 and stuff. I just, you know, again, you can't have everything. Um, I don't know why we don't talk about more. They're great amps. So it's one of the best solid-state clean amps in the in the world. It's it's iconic. It's, uh, it's well-loved and respected. Uh, Glenn Bailey says, just to say thank you for giving us a place to hang out. Uh, for this long congrats for 350 episodes thank you so much um i think you guys as much uh, every time you think me i gotta thank you guys back because it's uh it's been it's crazy right who would have thought this is a world we live in 
where we get to just hang out and talk about stupid guitar stuff that isn't stupid, but you understand what I'm saying. Uh, this is K Dog says, please accept this on behalf of your dog. I hope they recover soon. Hey, thank you. Appreciate that. Can you advise the best way to get a ding out of a guitar finish? Is a satin stain. Ah, oh, that's tough. A uh, small and shallow ding on the horn of an explorer. So I have a video about steaming dents out when the wood is unfinished. Um, and sometimes when you have finished, you can do buildup with like super glue and sandpaper and kind of blend it out. But on that one, that's too tough. But like I said, the good news, K-Dog, is, is that I will save this question because like I said, I have some guests coming on some bonus shows and they specialize in things that I don't specialize in to handle these kind of questions. And what's great is I'm gonna save this question. Actually, I'm doing it right now, just like I did the other one, so we don't forget. And so we can ask them because that's what's great, right? Um, I, that's why I wanna do that. I wanna have guests on, but not guests to just, you know, be here to promote their thing or talk about things to actually interact with you guys and and add more value uh to things that i don't i don't cover uh craig says previous owner put chrome covers over the stock sg tribute pickup bobbins okay yeah i did that to uh, a gibson i had too i put chrome covers on the pickups i want to sell but i doubt i can remove them without damage no you could totally uh remove the chrome pickups without damage um First, you might be lucky and they didn't solder the covers on. So I would pull the pickups out and look. And if they're not there, if you don't too, see two globs of solder um, on both sides of the pickup, uh, I would just grab the pickup and pull. <laughs> it's gonna probably covers going to come right off. Now, if there's two globs of solder where they basically have soldered the cover on, you will then need to desolder that. And um, you can use braid or solder soaker to get that solder up. If you've never removed solder, it's something you can probably easily figure out on a YouTube video. Um, you don't even need to see, watch a specific guitar YouTube video. It's tons of videos on how to remove solder. Uh, and just remove the solder and pull the covers off. It's really not that hard. Um, and, uh, if they did it right, there'll be a piece of foam tape or something in between the slugs and the cover. Um, if they dip them afterwards, it'll be fine. There'll just be some wax build up and you'll have to take that off. Um, so, I mean, if that's, so, you know, it's an easy thing to do. And, uh, I, I mean, like I said, and, and not a lot of risk, uh, some risk, cause like I said, you can damage it, but you would have to be pretty aggressive to damage anything. Uh, Randy C uh, Crooks says, Hey, Phil, a friend of mine plays with a band in Phoenix called the Crown Kings. Thought you might want to check them out. I will try and check them out. I'll, I'll Google it. I'm sure they're on Facebook. Um, I've been trying to think about getting out of the, getting out of the house more. <laughs> seems like I'm, I'm stuck here a lot. Um, I want to do something a little fun. I told the, uh, and here's what it is. Um, I want to, I, if you notice, I strategically, uh, would not pick the paid, uh, the super chats for the giveaways um, because I didn't think that was fair uh, to the people who didn't do the super chats, right? That's, so I, I picked everybody who is not super chatting. I now want to pick a super chat and do a giveaway as well. So if you guys don't mind, as I look around. Okay, so uh, let's do this. Let me go through here randomly and grab a super chat for a giveaway. And... I'm somehow not doing it. Okay, scroll. I gotta do it like randomly. And please. Okay, ready? Random. Scrolling. I wanna make it so fast I can't see. I'm trying to keep it easy. And and of course I did it once and I grabbed somebody from last week. That doesn't even make sense. Okay, let's do it again. Okay, we have Maddie B. Maddie B for the uh, uh, correct about the Shaw Buckers resistance wiring. You just won a swag bag as well. Um, so we'll have some Strandberg stuff in there. We'll have some New Yorker stuff. We'll have a tuner in there. Um, it'll be um, it'll be a little different. This Strandberg's and some other stuff too. But like I said, I'll, I'll work you up a little swag bag. It'll be just like what the, you know, reminiscent of what everybody else won. And that way, everyone's really fair. But I did two non-super chats and one super chat. Because, again, I just want to keep it a little fun and fair if uh, we could. And um, and there you go. And I want to do one last thing. Here's the one last thing. Because it's 350 episodes, right? It's got to be a big deal. We're giving away 
$1,100 guitar for those of you guys who are going to enter that. We gave him some swag packs to Super Chats and others. Now I'm going to do the last one, which, by the way, on the Supers, here's the last ones. Hold on a second. <laughs> this is not working the way I thought. Okay, there it is. Okay, it is. It won't let me do it. I was going to try to do something cool. <laughs> so let's just do one last cool question. Um, uh, let's see. The, the I want to do one last question. We'll end the show with one last question, but the last question gets a giveaway. Okay, so I'm scrolling. So ask a question now, but I'm scrolling back into the questions as well. And like I said, put a question mark at the beginning. Let's do one more. Um, um, okay, this is uh, Joey. And this is a question about the, uh, not a great question. I mean, it's a great question, but you guys might not enjoy it. Um, as much, but I, I thank him for actually asking the question. It was really good. So Joey, uh, B. Rube, I'm probably B. Rube, B. Rube, I'm, I'm probably butchering your name. Uh, he says, which way of supporting the channel gives you the biggest percentage of the money we send? It is Patreon. So YouTube takes um, 35 to 40% of the money. So when you give me $5 through members, uh, you can imagine I, I, like, I get three and YouTube gets $2 of that. And then sometimes there's processing too. So if you live in a different country, there's an exchange processing rate and all this stuff. Um, so so same, with, uh, same with Super Chats. You know, somebody's like, oh, $10 Super Chat. It's very thankful for that, dollar Super Chat. But keep in mind, they're taking 35, 40% of it. Um, they say it's 35, but in my experience, it's usually rounding about 40%. So if I if I get $10, I get six of it and they get four of it. Patreon um, is funny because Patreon actually takes uh, a, a good percentage too, but my, my patron was set up so long ago that I'm grandfathered into an old percentage uh, pro program with patron. If I do an, uh, if I do anything to, uh, I guess, update it or change it, they're going to make me take the newer rate. Um, and that rate is much lower. It's like 10%. So if you give me $10 on Patreon, I keep like $9 of it. Um, and then, uh, and that line with merch, same thing. Merch, I is a, I'm lucky. I don't even get, you know, 50% of what a merch sell is for the most part. Um, so the, the patron is the highest rate that is given to me. Um, but thank you for asking that. But I will say this, don't worry about that guys. I, I will tell you that because I think sometimes you want to know this stuff. You know, what do we make and how do we, how do you figure it out? Cause I see some people, they look and they see, I got a hundred dollars in super chats. They don't realize like, yeah, it's, it's $60 though. And then, you know, and then the IRS wants some. So, but, uh, B Rube, uh, uh, I'm, I hope I'm not butchering your last name. Uh, but, uh, if I am, this will make up for it. Uh, go to knowyourgearpodcast.com and send me an email. Let me know that you, I picked your question and I'm going to give you your choice of a Laney bass distortion pedals worth $200. What? But if you're a bass player, if you're a guitar player, you will get a Laney chorus pedal worth $200. Uh, these are made in UK and um, you can pick which one. You just tell me which one and I'll send one out. And uh, so you just want yourself a nice UK made $200 pedal. You're either going to be making some chorus or you're making some bass overdrive. You get to choose. Um, if you didn't understand the theme today, I wanted to give away an acoustic guitar. I wanted to give away something bass. I wanted to be, you know, let everybody guitar stuff, acoustic guitar stuff, or electric guitar stuff. So there you go. So now we have my work cut out for me for uh, getting stuff shipped out next week. I'm sure Shauna will help me with that. As always, guys, I want to thank you guys so much for hanging out for all these episodes, man. It's been really cool. And um, and I, I'm just super thankful uh, for everyone. And um, I'm going to end the show with what I messed up last week. So at the, at the Kiesel event, I was given a gift I want to share with you guys. My wife was given one, and I was given one. The problem is the l lovely gentleman who gave us this, um, if you see this, uh, can you please reach out to us at the Know Your Gear podcast. Um, my wife is trying to give you your uh, girlfriend credit because she makes these on Etsy and we would like to do a shout out in case anyone gets on these Etsy. So he made, uh, his girlfriend made me this bag. It's got guitars on it. Look at that. And um, 
which is great for for me because my wife really likes to have bags like this for all kinds of stuff. Now, what's funny is, cause he, and look at the inside. Isn't that cool? So he, he did this as a gift. Like I said, his girlfriend made it and he gave it to me. I want to again thank him for the beautiful gift. But what he maybe knew or didn't know, I don't know if he knew this or not, his girlfriend made one for my wife so she doesn't have to take mine. And my wife's has bees on it. My wife is a huge fanatic bee fan. Like if, she loves bees, okay? So much so. So beautiful gifts. I just want to share that with you. You know, it's a it's one of those things in life. It's so hard to explain when you meet strangers and they're giving you gifts. It's a very humbling experience, uh, especially when they make them. Um, and uh, every time it just kind of hits you because uh, you just don't know how to, I don't know how to do it. I don't know how to uh, thank you enough. Uh, you know, you're a stranger and here you are giving us beautiful handmade gifts. But if you see this, please, if you could email us uh, with your girlfriend's Etsy page, I would love to shout out and and let people know if they want to support your you and your your girlfriend for the lovely gifts. Thank you so much again. I want to thank everybody for hanging out for the show. And uh, and uh, I guess I'll see you guys next Friday for 351. And in the meantime, there'll be a bunch of videos in between finally because I'm releasing videos now again. And um, uh, thank you guys. I love you guys so much. And I guess I'll end with know your gear. And as always, know your gear. <laughs>